Dear friends and colleagues, a very good evening to all and welcome to the webinar on living with chronic kidney disease. Dr. S. Gurmad Rao, President of FAC Medical and Health Science University, distinguished speakers of today's webinar, deans of constituent colleges and deans of the university, faculty, staff, students, and ladies and gentlemen. Once again, warm greetings to all in today's webinar we have three talks followed by panel discussion the three talks are overview of chronic kidney disease by dr raghavendra bhat management of chronic kidney disease by dr martin thomas and living with chronic kidney disease by dr s sundar we have world renowned nephrologist for panel discussion as you know, chronic kidney disease is a long-term condition where the kidneys do not work as well as they should. It is a common condition often associated with getting older. It can affect anyone. Chronic kidney disease can get worse over time and eventually the kidneys may stop working altogether, but this is uncommon. Many people with chronic kidney disease are able to live long lives with the condition. Chronic kidney disease only reaches an advanced stage in a small proportion of people. However, even if one's condition is mild, it is important to take good care of oneself to stop it getting worse and reduce the risk of other health problems such as cardiovascular diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite our honorable president, Dr. S. Gurmadurao, to deliver his inaugural address. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, because we have a global uh, audience. I'm very happy and proud uh, to welcome all of our uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers for today's uh, webinar, our RACM HSU family members, and then the distinguished uh, speakers from outside, Professor Shankar, Shankar Sundar, and uh, Professor Anupam Agarwal. Actually, I'm very happy that both of them have the Manipal connection. And I'm also feeling happy today because I also have a 28 years of close association with the Manipal group. Let me congratulate the Rack College of Medical Sciences for organizing this very important webinar. And I thank both of you, Professor Sundar and Professor Anupam Agrawal for agreeing to be part of this very important uh, webinar. In fact, for the delegates, I think I should tell you that uh, both Dr. Anupam Agrawal and Professor Sundar, you know, when you hear their story, it will be a big uh, inspiration for everybody. With the reference to the kidney transplantation, with the reference to the, the service, what they have done, uh, to the nephrology. Let me also welcome all other speakers of our Rackham HSU family, Professor Abdul Bassett, Professor uh, Butt, Professor uh, Iladi, and Professor Martin, again, who have contributed very uh, significantly for uh, the nephrology. I should tell you just uh, briefly about Rack uh, Medical and Health Sciences University. We are situated in Ras al Khaimah, which is the northernmost uh, area in the United Arab uh, Emirates. We are a 15-year-old uh, health science university. We are having medical, dental, pharmacy, and uh, nursing programs. And uh, in Ras al Khaimah, it is under the able leadership of our uh, Highness, the ruler of Ras al Khaimah, His Highness uh, Sheikh Saud bin Sakar al Qasim. 
So it's with the great pleasure I welcome all the speakers, including the international speakers. And as all the delegates know, all of us know, the kidney is the one organ gets the hit, whether it is a systemic disease, whether it is by medication by the doctors or several other uh, reasons. And as you know, the chronic renal disease has become a major challenge. But fortunately now, if you take the last 30 years, you know, the advancement is very, very significant and very appreciable uh, uh, development. But only one thing we need to take care of as health science professionals, that the patients, in spite of all the advancement, still so much to be done. And that's why the purpose of today's webinar is to make final adjustments with ourselves so that in spite of the disease, we can live uh, comfortable. So once again, it's with great pleasure, I welcome Professor Sundar, Professor Anpam Agarwal, and all our speakers from Rakam HSU uh, family and all the uh, delegates. I'm sure it will be a very useful uh, webinar. In fact, one of the outcome of, a positive outcome of uh, COVID is uh, the development of these online uh, conferences through webinar and through uh, other online mechanisms. So, wish you all the very best and have a nice time. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for encouraging words and welcoming the audience. Without further delay, we will start the webinar. I request all the participants to post their questions, if any, in the chat box, and they will be addressed address during the panel discussion later. Our first speaker for today is Dr. Raghavendra Bhatt. Dr. Bhatt is Professor of Internal Medicine at Rack College of Medical Sciences, RAKMHSU. He has done both MBBS and MD internal medicine from Prasurva Medical College, Manipal. Before joining the RACOMS, he was working as professor and head at Kasturba Medical College, Mangalore, which is a constituent college under Manipal Academy of Higher Education. He received five gold medals during his medical training. He is an excellent teacher, clinician, and researcher during his three and a half decades of long experience. He has published over 30 national and international publications and six medical books written using his own personal experience. He was a PG teacher and guided over 30 students for his their MD thesis. Now I would like to invite Dr. Raghavendra Bhatt to deliver his talk. Dr. Bhatt, please. Is my presentation visible? Yes, yes. No, I can't see the presentation myself. I, I can't see the presentation myself. Where is the presentation? We have bought a 10 years old photo, Dr. Bhatt. How are you, sir? <laughs> you still is charming, don't worry. Okay, you see the yeah, good evening. I thank the organizers of the webinar for making me a part of this webinar, and I'm very happy to be around, particularly Dr. Anupam Magarwal, one of my best students, and Dr. Sundar, one of my best friends, is around. I start this, my talk, living with CKD, the overview of CKD. I take you back to my own original time when the 
uh, students were exposed to chronic kidney disease, there was absolutely no reference to kidneys. The kidneys were taught in a very small way. Heart and brain got the heart and brain got the most important exposure, whereas the kidneys got very little exposure. So we did not know much. Why is chronic kidney disease important? Because of three C's. It is common, it is continuous, and it gives rise to complications. It is frightening to know that almost one in 10 of the global population have this disease, and many people, millions of people are getting the renal replacement therapy, and more important, many are not getting, and they are dying out of it. How common is common? I was very surprised to see a 7 million patient uh, study of systematic review and meta-analysis. About 14 to 15% of the general population and about 36% of the high-risk populations had chronic kidney disease. That's amazingly common. And I, I feel so sorry that it, the disease CKD gets so little importance as compared to heart and brain should have got far more importance and far more budget. More than one in seven of the people in the United States and at least one in three of the people of the United, uh, European Union are exposed to the risk of kidney disease. We were told kidney produces urine, but kidney does, does produce urine, but it has a lot of connections. It's not a simple organ, it just produces urine and sleeps at other times. It does a lot more things. It is very well connected to the rest of the body, rest of the endocrine system, heart, and there is its hand and role, important roles in blood pressure maintenance, acid-base balance, control of solutes, fluids, endocrine functions, metabolic waste excretion, and drug metabolism, storage of things, production of hormones. You name it, kidney does it. You name it, kidney does it. And it has integral connections with the heart and brain. Heart and kidney are very good friends. If one fails, other ones follows. They, as long as they're healthy, they help each other a lot. They're very good friends that way. The most important reason why kidney disease is becoming common is because hypertension and diabetes are very common and they are the two main drivers for this, the disease of chronic kidney disease. They're main drivers. Because they're common, kidney disease is common. Every third person is diabetic in developed countries. Every third or fourth person is having hypertension. So, which means these two together contribute to a large number of cases of chronic kidney disease, almost 60%. Now, we all know that the glomerular filtration rate is the one which goes on slowly decreasing with age. And when it decreases to a certain level, the kidney stops functioning and it requires external help. So this only is a tip of the iceberg. Stage one, stage two is there in books we never see. Patient doesn't know, nor his symptoms, he never comes. It's the stage three that they come for the first time. Stage four and five, when the symptoms are established, the precious little can be done to help them accept RRT, renal replacement therapy. So we are virtually seeing the tip of the iceberg. We are seeing that there is a situation where the iceberg, like the Titanic, we are only seeing the tip of the iceberg and not the disease itself. Now, coming to the most important two players in the game, kidney and the heart, the diabetes is all about sugar. Sugar is good as long as it's giving calories, but too much sugar is bad. It produces glucose-induced glucotoxicity, and there is going to be non-enzymatic glycation, a, a, a situation where glucose produces damage to the organ. I'm only talking about one organ, that's the kidney, though it happens in all organs. In fact, the hemoglobin A1C that we test is also an example of non enzymatic glycation. This results in this results in the kidneys in increased matrix, damage to the basement membrane of the glomerulus, and also the efferent and different arterioles. In other words, less blood flows to the glomerulus and tries to clear the waste more efficiently. You know, for a while it works, after that it doesn't work. Now, when this happens, the blood supply to the kidney becomes less and the people develop hypertension. And when hypertension develops, it's the closest friend of the heart, the closest friend of the kidney, heart suffers. So, with almost a certain stage of chronic kidney disease, they develop hypertension, left ventricle becomes thick and the left ventricle eventually fails. So, these two friends are the main players of the game and the main sufferers. Now, 
This is the picture given by Netter, who has given all the clinical features. Now, for a student or a doctor to understand this is very difficult. He must know everything to understand, which becomes increasingly complex. Suffice it to say here that ultrasound of the kidney is today considered as a part of clinical examination. Small kidney, hypertension, color is chronic kidney disease as far as the practice is concerned. But can we simplify this and try to explain in simple terms how this developed? That's my effort for the day. How we teach the students over here, how we try to make the communication easier and subject simpler. Now, this is how the textbook like Harrison views. But this becomes very difficult for the common man to understand. So I will do something different. Now, I will have a story of a clock. The clock is the timer and it gives as you know, there are 12 numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. When the, clock, when the glomerular filtration rate gets off mark, we are at 1 o'clock position, a very little damage. Only thing is, I warn you, the clock may not go according to the hours shown here. Some hours may come out of turn and therefore clinical features may not be exactly following this, but we will very clearly understand what will be the features. At one o'clock position, is, there is a work of the kidney to concentrate during the renal tubule is so efficient, whatever you drink, however much water you drink, it is able to get rid of the water. However little you drink, it is able to conserve the water. This is a very important function of the renal tubule. And this is the first function to be affected, one of the first functions to be affected in chronic kidney disease. So much so, the urine passed at any given time will have the same specific gravity of 10, 10, and the patient gets up at night to pass urine. It's, it's mistaken for diabetes or prostatic enlargement, and people don't come to a doctor for that. This is called as isocenuria. At two o'clock position, you have electrolytes and acid base. The phosphate excretion is a very specialized function by the kidney. If that fails, the phosphate builds up, producing hyperphosphatemia. In turn, it goes and reduces the calcium, which in turn stimulates the parathyroid hormone to produce more parathormone, it erroneously thinks body is not having enough calcium, more parathormone is produced, more calcium is collected. And when calcium levels goes up by absorption and excretion and pre preventing the loss from kidney, blood calcium goes up and it goes and gets deposited in various places, including the kidney, and it may demineralizes the bones. So the more the calcium, bones become weak. So this is a very important endocrine change. In addition to that, there is also a metabolic acidosis coming in. And because the acid doesn't get excreted, metabolic acidosis comes and potassium levels increase. These two are dangerous things and potassium increase to a certain degree can kill. At three o'clock position, the blood supply going to the kidney becomes less, renal ischemia, and this stimulates renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, and this increases the blood pressure. This is the link, my friends, between the kidney failure and the heart. When the blood pressure goes up, the left ventricle has to work harder against greater resistance to pump the blood all over, so it develops hypertension. And hypertension, kidney disease, and anemia are three great friends. All three usually go together and pointer to the diagnosis. At four o'clock position, there are endocrine changes. Erythropoietin, a substance required for production of red blood cells produced exclusively by the kidney, fails and the patient gets anemia. Vitamin D3 is not being activated, bones become weak, so there is osteodystrophy. All over the bone cells weaken their pulse. And there is hypertension because of the renin, renin angiotensin system. At five o'clock position, there is hypoalbuminemia. There is damage to the basement membrane, as I showed you, and that will result in leakage of albumin through the urine. So more albumin goes, less remains in blood, and the albumin levels go down. The other friend, liver, says, okay, I will help you, produces more and more albumin. It gets lost. And in the enthusiasm to produce albumin, it also produces more lipids, giving rise to hyperlipidemia, which accelerates atherosclerosis. At six o'clock position, you have accelerated atherosclerosis, which promotes premature atherosclerosis, premature coronary artery disease, stroke, gut ischemia, peripheral vascular disease, and erectile impotence, and acquired renal atherosclerosis, further compounding hypertension. At seven o'clock position, you have got urinary loss of proteins. Now, we mentioned albumin already, producing hypoalbuminemia. There is loss of globulin, producing immunosuppression and increased infections. There is 
in antithrombin 3 a break this is for the system of thrombin a coagulant it is a it has an inherent break for antithrombin now if this antithrombin escapes in urine the thrombin works more than what is needed producing thrombosis including deep vein thrombosis and thrombosis in the renal veins this is called hypercoagulable state which is dangerous at eight o'clock position you have uremic lung the lung the capillaries will be more porous they can get pulmonary edema they can get pneumonia like picture pleura can be involved they can get pleurisy pleural thickening pleural effusion so lung suffers in chronic kidney disease then they have the general findings when you examine head to toe you find a particular type of nail called terry nails very interesting part of it is red part of it is brown part of it is white half also called half and half nails the brown half is because of toxic metabolites collecting the white half is because of the anemia and pallor they also have deposition of calcium in the cornea producing band keratopathy and there is going to be itching all these are features of kidney involvement of the ckd chronic kidney disease then in the blood there is inhibition of the bone marrow rbc production is less producing anemia pallor fatigue white blood cells are less producing infection and fever and platelets are less producing bleeding at 11 o'clock position there is involvement of the central and peripheral nervous system central nervous system involvement produces stroke peripheral nervous system involvement produces peripheral neuropathy and restless leg syndrome and some of them develop psychosis because of multiple reasons so, towards the last part of the story the 12 o'clock position the person now needs help his glomerular filtration rate is very less he needs help and to survive barely existence survive he needs dialysis and the transplantation and or transplantation and he may sometimes develop other complications during dialysis so this is the story of clinical features this is how we teach our students and we try to make it very clear now comes various ways it can present a patient doesn't come and tell us i have ckd in fact they don't know most of the time they may come as an emergency to the nephrologist in a dialysis and they take an ec they find a pointed peak tall t waves they're very breathless this is hyperkalemia a situation life or death matter sometimes it's difficult to do a dialysis because of the thickening and calcification of vessels this is called as the monkey boy sclerosis involving the tunica media this is because of deposition of calcium in abnormal places in such people it's a challenge to do hemodialysis I mean, how to do other things like peritoneal dialysis you may come to a cardiologist for acute breathlessness and that's pulmonary edema the two good friends i told you kidney has failed so now heart is not able to bear the burden and he may develop pulmonary edema and this can be a killer this person may go to a surgeon with a mass in the abdomen non-pulsatile mass or he may go to an internist for secondary hypertension the, the father says my son is only 20 years old high blood pressure doctor see what is happening none of us have hypertension that is secondary hypertension of polycystic kidney disease he may end up with the endocrinologist for a situation of hypoglycemia suddenly the blood pressure the blood sugar goes down and the blood pressure starts rising so rising blood pressure falling sugar may mean a endocrine change also the bones become weak so the growth failure may be there maybe the child doesn't grow ends up short bones bend bow legs this is renal osteodystrophy this can come at any age sometimes we find it in young children with congenital renal tubular disorders also the person may end up in the most unlikely place with a psychiatrist with psychosis there are three conditions where a very important medical condition may end up with psychosis psychiatrist one is psychosis of chronic kidney disease one is hypoglycemia and third one is hypothyroidism and it's very important to screen these psychosis people for these things at some point of time so that we don't miss reversible conditions so in a nutshell we have tried to say the main functions sodium balance potassium excretion acid excretion calcium phosphate balance and erythropoietin and if it is not there what will happen i try to tell so our treatment depends on compensating that so we have to restrict diet restrict salt give diuretic some time to time avoids NSAIDs which further damage the kidney may have to give sodium bicarbonate may have to give phosphate binders and calcium emetics to keep the bone healthy 
Now, this is how we put up a concept chart at the end of the class where we find we, everything is there in five levels anatomy, pathophysiology, clinical features, diagnosis, management. This is not only to understand the concept, this has got all the trigger words with which they can appear for any competitive exams with one reading of this, almost everything is covered. So, finally, we tell our students or the doctors that chronic renal failure has four options one is hemodialysis, one is peritoneal dialysis. One is transplant. And the fourth option is nothing. Nothing is an option for this disease. Please remember, particularly when the age is very high or the economically not possible, family can't afford. Don't make them feel guilty that if you had so much money, you would have done a transplant. No, it is not like that. We'll do all that is possible, best that we can. But nothing is an option in this disease, particularly where nothing is possible. These are my references. Dear friends, thank you for a patient hearing. Let us together slow down the clock of security, the doctors helping the patient and patients or the susceptible patients by living better, by preventing diabetes, preventing hypertension, if they have controlling hypertension, controlling diabetes better. And diet is the most important thing that drives and prevents and helps is less sodium, more water, less sodium and please do not take an anti-inflammatory drugs unless it is very 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 required and stop smoking lose weight these few things the kidneys we can save let's together today pledge on the day of the racket message webinar we will slow down the clock of ckd so that the clock lasts longer and we will have our patients more healthy for a longer time Thank you very much for giving me this wonderful opportunity to be around here. It's my great pleasure to be with you all, try to share some thoughts. And I, I am very happy to have my friends around here, Anupam Agarwal and Sundar. And I thank the president of the university and the dean for having given me this chance. Thank you one and all. Well done, Murak. But Yes. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Very sir. well done, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you're really, really a good teacher. I wish I was your student. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bhatt, for giving a clear overview of chronic kidney disease in simple words. The next speaker is Dr. Martin Thomas Kurian, consultant nephrologist, Ibrahim bin Hamid Ubaidullah Hospital, Rasal Kaima, and Adjunct Associate Professor at RACOMS, RACMHSU. He has done his MBBS and MD from Fasuba Medical College, Manipal, and DM Nephrology from Christian Medical College, Bangalore. He also attained additional postgraduate qualification DNB in nephrology in the year 1999. He was a specialist micro nephrologist in Ministry of Health in Abu Dhabi from the year 2000 to 2006. He worked as consultant nephrologist in India in a private sector and government of India from 2006 to 2013. He is currently working as consultant nephrologist at Ubaidullah Hospital since 2013. He is a member of Russell Kaima Research and Ethics Committee under Ministry of Health. He is a member of Advisory Board of Rack College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, member of Mortality Committee, Ibrahim bin Ahmed Obedullah Hospital, Rack. He has about 10 publications in reputed journals. Now I invite Dr. Martin to deliver his talk on management of chronic kidney disease. Dr. Martin, please. Good evening, good morning to all my senior colleagues around the world. I thank the Dean, the President of the University and the organizers for giving me an opportunity to interact and also learn about the chronic kidney disease. I am given to understand that uh, there is a significant number of registration uh, constituted by medical students and also by primary care physicians. So 
my aim or my focus of the talk would be directed mainly to the primary care physicians who are an important link in the hidden iceberg of early chronic kidney disease and to my dear students whom i interact a lot as part of the adjunct faculty of rak medical university i go on to my presentation my outline would be defining chronic kidney disease a uh, few words on the prevalence the focus of my talk namely the role of primary health providers of course doc, my senior colleague dr raghavendra bhat has touched on the stages of chronic kidney disease but we need to review or revise the stages of chronic kidney disease who are those at risk for chronic kidney disease as as it has already been mentioned that most patients with chronic kidney disease may not manifest significant clinical manifestations what are the screening methods for ckd who are the persons that we need to be suspicious and screen how to screen when to suspect the general principles of treatment can be slow the progression of chronic kidney disease and just a slide about the futuristic trends in our armamentarium to fight chronic kidney disease now if you just look at the definition or what we mean by chronic kidney disease uh, it means two things we know that the kidney is a functional organ so it functions as importantly as an excretory organ as well as an endocrine organ and as we know it, the kidney has a three dimensional structure so the structure can also be damaged now if the structure is damaged or the function of the kidney is decreased for more than a period of 3 months there is a decrease in glomerular filtration rate as what we have learned previously in our physiology and the pathological abnormalities could be various markers of kidney damage such as what comes out as abnormalities in the urine sediment or we do an imaging test like an ultrasound or a ct where you see an abnormality of the structure there could be a disorder of the tubules a person may be transplanted so his kidneys may not be functioning 100% we are going to hear more on that by our esteemed colleague from india and you can calculate the glomerular filtration rate uh, in which excuse me there is a little bit of a i think my slides were not visible so that is being looked at give me a second <coughs> the slides are not moving there is no, no movement of slides yeah let's i'm um, just being helped technically can the slides be seen now can the slide be seen now
are the slides uh, is the slide visible is it visible sir can you change one to ah, three slides visible, visible. yes uh, move on little bit yeah has it moved yes yeah yeah uh, okay yeah. good I, I i'm sorry that there was a small technical glitch but we go on uh, now the question is why is chronic kidney disease important this has already been touched on because the number of patients with chronic kidney disease is growing worldwide and we have two important diseases as what has already been mentioned mainly diabetes and hypertension and they are so uh, common all over the world and they are contributing to the two most common causes of advanced renal failure or end stage renal disease increasing its prevalence and incidence the other problem is that chronic kidney disease is associated with a high risk of death from cardiovascular disease especially in patients with dialysis as we know uh, the biggest chunk of death is attributed to cardiovascular disease and mortality in patients with end stage renal disease is so many times higher than the general population and the focus in uh, recent years the focus in recent years uh, is to optimize care during the phase of chronic disease before the onset of end stage renal disease and as we know government governments around the world and the healthcare systems around the world are struggling with the high cost of healthcare especially contributed by the growing number of chronic kidney disease this slide has been shown earlier uh, just wanting to highlight that chronic kidney disease can be silent in a large majority of patients and that's the problem uh, as nephrologists we all know that the ckd stage 5 its symptoms and its ultimate complications like pulmonary edema and uremia suddenly bursts on the scene and then it's tragic to explain to the patient that his kidneys have gone so we need to target the silent majority which mainly remains under the surface and hence the famous iceberg model which constitutes uh, stage one to stage three including even stage four and only stage five is visible and as i mentioned earlier it is the primary care physicians around us our colleagues who need to help us in looking under the surface to hit the silent disease just a few uh, lines on chronic kidney disease in uae the dialysis prevalence in abu dhabi this was 2015 statistics is around 370 per million population the annual growth is 12 15 percent and the dialysis population is likely to double in the next five years that was in 2015 it's already 2020 and it is increasing most patients just like how it is around the world present to dialysis as an emergency and only 2.7 percent have an arteriovenous fistula at the first dialysis remember that uh, the the population here it has a significant number of expatriates from around the world especially from the indian subcontinent and the rest of the countries from the middle east and the philippines a slide on the incidence and prevalence of end stage renal disease which shows a significant increase uh, this is uh, up to 2010 where the numbers are increasing and then you have a projection upwards so the uh, numbers are significantly increasing around the world especially uh, developing countries are and healthcare system is struggling to meet the high demands so i'm again focusing on my friends the primary care providers 
who are the first line of defense against chronic kidney disease. They play a significant role in early diagnosis, treatment, and patient education. And they are most useful in the therapeutic interventions for diabetic chronic kidney disease. And these are similar to those required for optimal diabetes care because there will be control of glucose, adequate blood pressure control, and lipids. And they, the primary care providers, are the first line in detecting chronic kidney disease and managing it prior to referral. Uh, and this has been shown to significantly improve patient outcomes. So the message is CKD is part of primary care. And what can the primary care providers do? They recognize and test at risk patients who come to their clinics, who come to their hospitals. They are the first line of people who educate patients, make them aware of CKD and the treatment. Most of them are, would be diabetics, as we know. So they focus on good glycemic control. And for those with CKD, they look at controlling the blood pressure well beyond the uh, advised uh, values using an AC inhibitor or angiotensin receptor blocker. Maybe you will require usually more than one antihypertensive drugs in these patients. And the important message is avoiding drugs like non-steroidal, which is a very common phenomenon that I personally see on my referrals. Uh, more than 70% of them at some point of time have been taking NSAIDs over the counter by themselves. And I feel that is a very significant contributor to chronic kidney disease in many of our elderly patients. And uh, I'm in the process of sending a message across to our primary healthcare providers is that if they can make a significant contribution in passing on the message to our elderly population, uh, especially in this part of the world, to decrease their intake or to avoid NSAID, that would be a significant message. Again, the primary care providers can monitor the estimated GFR. There are calculators where you can just use it on your iPhone or your computer, or now most labs give you the estimated GFR. You can calculate the urinary albumin creatinine ratio. Of course, you can treat the cardiovascular risk, especially with smokers and hyperlipidemics. Screen for anemia, especially in those patients who once they develop chronic kidney disease, they become anemic. Many of them may become malnourished. Treat their metabolic bone disease, I'll come to that. Uh, if you have a good dietitian, a nutritional guidance is very important. Uh, then the primary care uh, provider consults or teams with a nephrologist to give the best care to the patient. And uh, more and more labs are being encouraged to report estimated uh, GFR and the urine albumin creatinine ratios as a, as a part of the standard of investigating these patients. Now to my students, there are only two simple tests which identify CKD in adults. There are others, but I think we have to focus on these two simple tests. One is the eGFR. Now that is estimated from the serum creatinine. Currently, we are using the CKD EPI or what is known as the CKD Epidemiology Collaboration 2009 Creatinine Equation. So most research and most institutions around the world are now following this standardized EPI formula for eGFR. Just download this app. You have it on your smartphone. The lab provides you this value of eGFR you have it on your computer. So it just calculates from the creatinine and gives you an E estimated eGFR based on the CKD EPI. Now for research purposes and for much more 
uh, additional accuracy and precision. This is just an additional important uh, point to just know that uh, cystatin C can be used with creatinine and you can combine this to have what is known as the creatinine cystatin C equation which gives you a better uh, feel of the EGFR. Uh, a word about cystatin C, it is much more sensitive uh, than the creatinine, which is a little more cruder form of roughly estimating the glomerular filtration rate. But remember that serum creatinine is worldwide. It is universally available. And for now, in the clinical setting, that's the best that we have. The next simple test is the urine albumin to creatinine ratio in a spot urine sample test. In the old days, we used to uh, see patients. I remember when we were, uh, uh, we were in, as students, we used to give big bottles to the uh, patients to collect their urine over 24 hours. A part of the urine goes in, a part of the urine goes out. And the collections were not that very exact because measurement of 24 hours urine uh, albumin or protein uh, in the urine over a 24 hour period was very cumbersome but now we have an albumin creatinine ratio just a spot sample ideally if it can be done the early morning sample that would be ideal but there are other studies which show that even a, a, spot, a random spot sample is good enough and in fact, uh, we can stage chronic kidney disease now, incorporating the amount of albumin that is now being excreted in this spot urine sample. A1 being an albumin creatinine ratio of less than 30 milligram per gram. A2 meaning that you have a little more 30 to 300 milligram per, per gram that is moderately elevated albuminuria or the previous microalbuminuria. And then you go to A3, which is the macroalbuminuric stage, very significant amount of albumin being excreted, and that is more than 300 milligram per gram. This slide has been shown earlier, and any talk on staging of chronic kidney disease, has this slide has to be shown, where you already have calculated the glomerular filtration rate, and you put this into the various uh, ranges and you get your stages and remember students that stage five is uh, the last or the advanced stage of kidney failure where uh, at some point of time these patients may need uh, renal replacement therapy in the form of uh, dialysis either hemo or peritoneal dialysis if you look at the moderate uh, uh, stage three uh, this can be actually divided into uh, stage 3A or stage 3B uh, if you want to uh, be a little more specific in the journey of advancing chronic kidney disease. Uh, you may uh, remember that I mentioned that when the e you call it chronic kidney disease when the EGFR is less than uh, 60 ml per minute. Now, what, 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 so why do we call chronic kidney disease in those having EGFR more than 60 ml? Do, why do why do they also why are they also called chronic kidney disease? Now, they they could be having uh, EGFR of more than 60, many of them even more than 90, normal or even more, but they could have structural abnormalities, or pathological abnormalities, or uh, for example, a structural abnormality, one example is the polycystic kidney disease, where you may have a polycystic kidney disease, which is a structural abnormality. The, e, uh, the patient has chronic kidney disease, and it is a structural abnormality in the form of polycystic kidney disease. Now, once you have classified chronic kidney disease, and you can put uh, the stages on the uh, uh, x-axis and the albuminuria on the horizontal axis, 
and you can build up a prognostic indicator. Just a message in the slide is that the red that you're seeing are the ones, if they fall into the red zone, they are, uh, they are more advanced and their prognosis is worse in the form of uh, heart disease and the other complications of chronic kidney disease. Now, I said, I had mentioned kidney damage. So we need to indirectly see some of the markers of kidney damage. Namely, as I mentioned earlier, it is proteinuria or the small amount of proteinuria or albuminuria is the formerly known as microalbuminuria. Now it is mentioned as moderately elevated albumin excretion. Uh, if they have hematuria, if it is associated with proteinuria, but isolated hematuria may have other differentials in the form of either urinary infection or a stone or a malignancy. And then you look for active sediments in the urine like casts. Pathological abnormalities by radiology, namely ultrasound, CT, you can have multiple cysts with polycystic kidney disease. You can, you can visualize extensive scarring of the kidneys, which is also a damage. You can have smaller kidneys uh, and re cysts could be simple cysts, which are harmless, but if they are, they are complex cysts, then those will have to be evaluated, especially by our urology colleagues. And uh, if there are certain other indications, we will need more information of the kidney by a renal biopsy. I'm not going into that for lack of time. And so you can classify chronic kidney disease by the diagnosis also, mainly being diabetic kidney disease, glomerular disease, vascular disease, tubular interstitial disease, and so on. Now, why is optimizing care of advanced CKD important? Now, if you see the slope, the black line is a slope straight down. Now, if you can intervene early, the slope, the red one becomes, you know, the, the slope becomes less. And see the time in years. A person who is supposed to reach end-stage renal disease at seven years, you can extend it significantly, say, for nine years or even more. And earlier the intervention, the, the less the slope, and hence you can uh, delay the progression of chronic kidney disease. And that's what we are all... Uh, that's our business right now, including our primary care colleagues. Who do we screen? You just look at the risk factors. So diabetics, hypertensives, a previous history of acute renal failure. As I mentioned earlier, frequent NSAID use. You have a family history of kidney disease, diabetes, hypertension. Elderly people, 60 and older, do screen and race, especially uh, the African-American group. And uh, we are coming across sickle cell trait and uh, studies have shown that 2A whole one risk alleles have a higher risk for developing chronic kidney disease. Any patient who has a high risk should undergo evaluation. And they have to have, it has to be in periodic intervals, depending on the underlying disease and stage of the renal disease. And you identify potentially reversible causes. And the screening methods, as I mentioned, you, you look at the serum creatinine, you estimate the EGFR, you check the blood pressure, do an albumin creatinine ratio. And if you have in the primary care setting an ultrasound, please do an ultrasound which can look at the size, the echogenicity, look for scars or dilatation in the case of any obstruction. So the traditional testing for urine is dipstick. No more, we don't need 24-hour urine protein. You look at the urine albumin creatinine ratio. You can do a urine microscopic examination for the active sediments in the urine. The ideal one would be the early morning urine sample. And we have now strips to test for microalbumin. 
and then you can see whether he has chronic kidney disease or no and if he has then you identify the stage of chronic kidney disease try to identify a cause as what has been mentioned earlier and identify risk factors for progression and identify comorbidities in this particular patient management consists of conservative measures namely control of the risk factors both uh, mainly the modifiable risk factors and then you come to renal replacement therapy which has already been touched upon uh, uh, either hemodialysis peritoneal dialysis or a renal transplant and just showing this slide which again says that the chunk of chronic kidney disease is constituted mainly by diabetes which is the highest by hypertension and then comes others like glomerulonephritis and cystic kidney disease much lower down as we know that diabetes is so important that we have to have a meticulous control of blood sugars and once renal function is impaired many patients come and tell you doctor now i have my sugars very well controlled it means that the kidneys are metabolizing the insulin much more and hence the sugars or the need for the anti diabetic agents or insulin is much less in them you look at the albumin creatinine ratio treat them strict blood pressure control and use of ac inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers and the control of hypertension needless to say is the most inter most important intervention to slow progression and it, they are constituted mainly by the ac inhibitors or the arbs and uh, early detection and effective treatment of hypertension to target levels is important we have different targets coming over various uh, years and roughly the target now is around 130 to 585 in all patients with renal disease and if you have a significant urinary protein excretion of more than 1 g the target is even lower to less than 125 by 75 mm of mercury i just wanted to highlight the fact that ac inhibitors and angiotensin 2 receptor blockers mainly act on the efferent arterio and to maintain the uh, maintain the intraglomerular pressure there is a constriction of the efferent arterio the ac inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers uh, in fact decrease the intraglomerular pressure by uh, opposing the constricted efferent arterio uh, that apparently helps in decreasing the intraglomerular pressure and decreasing the proteinuria over a prolonged period of time and this is supposed to be the traditional theory of reno protection by ac inhibitors or arbs of course the primary care physician also has to look at weight loss advice in those patients who require it a salt restriction a protein restriction of around 0.8 g per kg but at the same time making sure that the patient does not go into malnutrition advanced cases of chronic kidney disease they would need to avoid potassium rich fruit uh, potassium rich food a fluid restriction if needed if the patient is fluid overloaded exercise and stopping of smoking and as i mentioned the cardiovascular mortality is so high in patients especially as the chronic kidney disease gets more and more advanced and especially in those patients who are end stage uh, uh, on dialysis their mortality is significant as have as constitute uh, as constitute with this by this graph compared to the general population now uh, chronic kidney disease means that there are a uh, plethora of other conditions uh, which are making chronic kidney disease treatment uh, important and one as you all know is anemia impaired production of erythropoietin and reduced number of blood cells and it is the anemia in most in 33% or more of patients with ckd stage 5 they have anemia of 
chronic kidney disease. There are there could be other causes of anemia in chronic kidney disease, but one important factor to remain is there could be concomitant iron deficiency. And uh, as nephrologists, we know that we have to look at the serum iron, the ferritin, the total iron binding capacity, and the transferrin saturation. Calculate the transferrin saturation, uh, which is uh, the total of serum ferritin divided by TIBC as a percentage. And if it is less than 20%, it means that oral iron alone will not be sufficient to correct the iron deficiency anemia. You will have to give IV iron. Now, if you look at the at the box on the right side, uh, you have oral preparations, and now you have even a phosphate binder, uh, namely ferric citrate, which also gives iron plus it binds the phosphate. Uh, if your transferrin saturation is less than 20%, then you will have to give iron. IV preparations. Previously, iron dextran, but it is now no more used. Iron sucrose was being used. But a very uh, useful uh, preparation is the ferric carboxy maltose, uh, which can be given uh, maybe in two doses over a period of two weeks, which will, uh, which will help to increase the iron stores in the patient, which helps to build up uh, along with erythropoietin to build up the hemoglobin in these patients. Why I put the box on the right is that actually there was a question before the uh, uh, before we started the seminar as to what are the iron preparations that we or what are the iron or the forms of iron that we can give for iron deficiency in chronic kidney disease. So ferrous sulfate, ferric citrate, and the IV preparations, namely iron sucrose and ferric carboxy maltose. Of course, then we have to look at the control of dyslipidemia, diet and statins. I'm not going into the details. Stop smoking it is part of treatment of CKD. Treatment of IV anemia, as I mentioned, uh, erythropoietin and IV iron. And uh, you have to earlier on itself evaluate for anemia when the GFR, when you pick up the patient with chronic kidney disease even earlier on. Now, along with this, there are other multiple complex issues. One is I touched upon anemia. Then I'm going to touch upon quickly the other problems that you have in a patient with chronic kidney disease. You have bone disease in which hyperphosphatemia is a major problem. And hence, you have to lower phosphate in your diet, which would not be enough. And then you have to use phosphate binders. And what does phosphate binders do? They bind the phosphate in the foot, in the gut. They decrease or discourage the absorption of the phosphate in the gut, and it passes out in the feces. So that's basically the principle of a phosphate binder. There could be calcium-containing phosphate binder. The simple one is the common chalk that we use on blackboard. It's calcium carbonate and non-calcium-containing uh, phosphate binder, namely cevalimer which is a little more expensive, but that is being used. Uh, we are finding that uh, calcium containing phosphate binders being used over a long time. And because of the calcium phosphorus metabolism impairment, there is also advanced atherosclerosis and calcification of the blood vessels in patients with chronic kidney disease, which may also be later contributing to the heart disease in such patients. I spoke about hypertension and how important it is to control them. Metabolic acidosis is something which is seen in chronic kidney disease. So many centers uh, advise oral bicarbonate supplementation. I touched on nutrition about the uh, low potassium diet, the phosphate binders, and the protein uh, intake of less than 0.8 gram per kilogram per day in stages uh, 4 and 5. And in others, probably you can still have a higher protein intake because now we are coming across a problem of malnutrition, especially in the developing countries. Treat the dyslipidemia. One thing about dyslipidemia is if a patient is already in stage renal disease and on dialysis, at that point of time, studies have shown it's not worth starting statins at that point of time because it does not give uh, any significant benefits to the patient.
but if the patient is already on a statin you continue but you don't start at that point of time our dyslipidemia management would be in the early stages of chronic kidney disease of course we need to educate the patient you have to counsel rehabilitation and then as the patient is advancing we have to prepare for renal transplant or a renal replacement in the form of uh, either hemodialysis or peritoneal dialysis the three forms of renal replacement therapy are mentioned as hemodialysis peritoneal dialysis and renal transplantation i'm not going into all the indications of uh, when to initiate dialysis but uremic encephalopathy uh, uremic pericarditis pulmonary edema refractory hyperkalemia are a few where you would uh, look as to when to start hemodialysis you are looking at hemodialysis only when you are reaching end stage uh, or ckd stage 5 and usually patients are started on dialysis support when the patients are symptomatic or when they have some of these indications at an egfr of around 5 to 10 ml per minute there was a question in which uh, 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 one of the participants had asked uh, that if early dialysis would be helpful now uh, the initiating dialysis early and late the ideal study that was the only randomized controlled trial that examined mortality related to the time of dialysis initiation and they found no difference in survival between early or late initiation of dialysis so as clinical nephrologists uh, we have to actually look at a at a particular patient see the need for initiating dialysis and start uh, at the right time so there is no one size fit fits all for a patient but generally at around uh, less than 5 ml or less than 10 ml per minute dialysis is usually started because they start developing complications and when you start hemodialysis this is the cuffed tunneled catheter you put into the internal jugular vein this is not ideal because the chances of infections are there and ideally you use the patient's own vessel to create what is known as a uh, arteriovenous fistula there are various anatomical positions you can create or if you cannot use the native vein you can use a uh, synthetic graft ptfe graft to bridge the uh, artery and the vein and you you basically do can do a hemodialysis from the fistula or the graft or the catheter basically through a filter to dialyze patients you can either have another form of uh, dialysis known as a peritoneal dialysis where the peritoneal membrane acts as the uh, filter you instill uh, fluid uh, into the peritoneal cavity and the waste uh, come come out into the pet, uh, into this fluid and then that is ex uh, that is uh, drained out and you may have to do about two or three or four cycles depending upon the need of different patients and finally you come to a renal transplant and this is another question which said that which has a better quality of life uh, patients on dialysis or patients on a transplant now uh, transplant improves quality of life and they also is see they are also seen to reduce mortality risk for most patients when compared with maintenance hemodialysis and dr sundar would probably highlight that in the subsequent uh, discussions so the primary care practitioner in at least up to stage 3 they are the ones involved in actually detecting and treating or monitoring all the problems of the patient and then probably at around stage 3 the nephrologists are consulted and further follow ups is done both by the nephrologists and the primary care uh, physician Uh, this slide just shows about the importance of avoidance of nsaid uh, contrast for coronary catheterization especially with chronic kidney disease has to be looked into aminoglycosides have to be looked into and uh, hypotension with diuresis have to be used so the key point in medications in chronic kidney disease are uh, you you again highlight the i am i want to highlight the fact that nsaid should not be avoided one word on uh, sgl2 inhibitors 
they are supposed to increase the amount of urinary glucose uh, uh, as an anti-diabetic agent. But the additional point that we have seen in this particular study is the Gredens study. Uh, when they looked at a large number of patients, they found that there was a 30% lower risk of primary outcomes uh, uh, as doubling of serum creatinine, end-stage renal disease, and death. So it decreased the progression of chronic kidney disease in addition to its anti-diabetic uh, 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 anti power. And also it helped to decrease death due to cardiovascular disease. This was something new as far as an anti-diabetic agent is concerned. I want, to tell, I want to just mention in one slide, what are the newer things which are happening around the world? Uh, in, in countries like, in developing countries like India, we are finding that the cost of a dialysis machine is very expensive. So uh, this particular company is now producing local dialysis machines at one third, less than one third of the cost of uh, uh, internationally branded dialysis machine. And hence, more number of low cost dialysis machines are being put up in primary centers which again decreases the cost of treatment. And then you have the wearable artificial kidney where the patient can move around uh, while dialysis is going on. You are getting more research into implantable bioengineered kidney where uh, nanomembranes are looked into, are put into a particular filter where the filtration can occur at a micro particle level. And then there are strategies for uh, uh, regenerative kidney engineering where uh, certain re, re, the certain particular cells can be used to cause uh, renal differentiation using bioprinting techniques so these are some of the latest things you have additional online resources i leave you to look into that if anyone is interested to look into that and the take-home points are the primary care physicians play an important role in identified risk factors no patients, uh, the glomerular filtration rate, use the standard measures for conservative treatment of chronic kidney disease, please avoid nephrotoxic agents, help your patients to adjust uh, medication, modify diet, partner and refer to specialists. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Martin, for a lucid and informative talk. The next speaker is Dr. S. Sundar, who is a consultant nephrologist and transplant physician, head of International Transport Services, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore. Dr. Sundar has experience of over 2,500 kidney transplants over three decades. He is the founder and director of Karnataka Nephrology and Transplant Institute since 1991 former Chief Nephrologist, Columbia Hospital, India. He's a founder member of Indian Society of Organ Transplantation, founder member of Peritoneal Dialysis Society of India, founder member and ex convener Nephrology Association of Karnataka, member of the Transplant Society International Member Association of, member of Association of Physicians of India, member of Asia Specific Society of Nephrology, ex chairman of India Society, Indian Society of Nephrology. He has been awarded many prestigious orations and presented and chaired many sessions and papers in national and international conferences. He is in the editorial board of Journal of American Society of Nephrology, Indian edition. He received lifetime achievement awards from the Indian Society of Nephrology and Kidney Patients Welfare Association of Karnataka. He is an adjunct professor of nephrology at Manipal Academy of Higher Education and chairperson of Indian Society of Nephrology. Now I invite Dr. Sundar to deliver his talk on living with renal transplant. Dr. Sundar, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bairi. A doctor, I would like to thank uh, Rock Medical College, Dr. Rao, the president, Dr. Bairi, Dr. Raghavendra, but my close friend and classmate. It's indeed an honor with all of you, especially having Anupam, also as part of our panel. What I'm going to do in the next 15-20 minutes is my own journey in the field of transplantation 
for the last 35 years. Now, these are the disclosures, and I always, any talk by paying homage and respect to my physiology teachers, Dr. Krishna Rao and Dr. Ellen Rao, kidneys not only make urine, but they also make the stuff of philosophy. Homer Smith, the physiologist, uh, renal physiologist, made this statement. And when I was a medical student, I thought that Dr. Krishna Rao is a fool, and Homer Smith must be a great You know that kidneys make urine. It has nothing to do with philosophy. But after 35 years in the field, I can tell you, kidneys has a lot to do with philosophy. In fact, medicine starts with philosophy and ends with philosophy. My own experience in the last 35 years, nearly more than 2,500 transplants, and I'm not going to go into the basics. This is already well dealt by my good friend, Dr. Ravindra Bhatt. And also, Martin has told you the functions of the kidney and what happens when kidney fails. But I must tell you the term uremia, which is the Greek term, which literally means urine in the blood. And Dr. Raghavendra Bhatt has clearly told you what happens when you have uremia and end-stage renal disease. The field of nephrology became famous or known thanks to two politicians. One is Jayaprakash Narayan in the 70s and M.G. Ramachandran, the former chief minister of Tamil Nadu, a famous actor in Tamil Nadu. So these two actually revolutionized the concept of nephrology. In fact, I was very lucky that in 1982, when I joined CMC Velour, that point of time, if you, anybody who's got kidney failure, they would not understand. But by 84, when M.G. Ramachandran developed kidney failure, even the yellow journals were carrying articles on kidney failure, dialysis, transplant. So all I would tell my patient was in Tamil that you got MGR disease and the patient would know. In fact, the patient would ask me, Sir, do you think I need hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, or transplantation? So it's in a way good if you have VIPs with kidney care, so the knowledge of kidney disease improves. That's what happened in my state and my neighboring state. I will not go into much into CKD registry. All of you know Dr. Raghavendra Bhatt and Martin has told you something on CKD, various stages. But by and large, if you look at our own uh, experience, half my practice is due to diabetic ESRD. Half my dialysis population, half my transplant is due to diabetic ESRD. Now, look at the problem of ESRD. ESRD is the type of CKD where life cannot go on without renal replacement therapy, that is RRT, which is dialysis, transplant, I'll come to the later on. The magnitude of the problem is just a guesstimate. Actually, we don't have real figures. We have got CKD registry in India, but still it's not accurate. It is not like the US RDS data where you get accurate figures. But roughly, our own guess estimate is that we have about 250 new cases per million population of ESRD in India. That means in a year, you are going to get 250,000 new cases. Please understand, 250,000 new cases added every year, which will require renal replacement therapy. And to manage these new cases, our Indian Society of Nephrology, the website tells us we have just about more than 1,000 nephrologists in the whole country. But I'm sure uh, Anupam would agree, and I'm sure he knows about it. He will tell you the number of nephrologists of Indian origin in American society is more than 1,000. So that tells us the difference how we can manage this disease in a country like India. Now, this again tells you how we are competing with China. We are going to overtake China in diabetes. 30% of all diabetics will end up with end-stage renal disease. So please understand that. And, uh, and as I already mentioned, half my practice of dialysis and transplantation is due to diabetic ASRD. In fact, ASRD is an epidemic. Diabetic ESRD is a pandemic. This is what uh, Eli Friedman keeps talking, and I agree with him oh, totally in my own practice. My own experience over 2,500 transplant, 42% is diabetic ESRD. Remaining 40%, they come in with small kidneys. We don't know what is the cause. It may be chronic interstitial nephritis, chronic glomerular nephritis. I don't know. So I call it God only knows because they come to me with small kidneys for transplantation. Then if you look at CKD, the CKD going into ESRD, that is state, is inevitable. There are interventions where we can do diet control, blood pressure control, lifestyle modification, and we can postpone the event, but we cannot avoid it. And once you reach ESRD, that is an end stage renal disease, there are, as Raghavendra Bhatt rightly said, there are three options, dialysis, transplant, and he said nothing. Nothing means death. 
That also is an option. Please understand, we have now what is called as palliative renal care. We allow patients to die peacefully with having dialysis or transplantation. Again, this I will not go into much detail, but again, it tells you once you have SRD, you can go for peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, and transplantation. These are the various options. That is an option which we must understand is quite acceptable, more so in a country like India, where resources are not there, either financial or manpower. So that is also options in the management of renal disease. Now, this again tells you historically how in 1954, if you see the picture here, it shows you the uh, Eric twins who were the first transplant recipient owner in Boston, home dialysis in 1960. This is 1990, my own unit to go, and some of the uh, new machines where it could undergo maintenance hemodialysis. Then peritoneal dialysis. This tells you again how we can have uh, what is called automated peritoneal dialysis machine, and we could have uh, dialysis. This is one of the patients from uh, India, nearly uh, many years still on automated peritoneal dialysis doing well. Now, the question which Martin also addressed is transplant better or better? This is a question that keeps coming on and on. I am a transplant nephrologist, so I'm biased towards transplantation, but let's look at it scientifically. One of the disadvantages of dialysis is the cost. The cost is enormous. So please understand, once we have that, I'm sorry, are you able to hear me? Could we put the... Yes, sir. We can hear you clearly. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, clearly. Okay, okay. So the disadvantage of hemodialysis in a country like India is the cost. If you look at our own dialysis, we charge in a Manipal hospital about 2,500 rupees per session. And it is not one dialysis, please understand. The person with end stage renal dialysis has to be on three times a week at least, twice or thrice a week, lifelong. So that costs a lot of money. But dialysis itself, the quality of life, long-term survival, there is no question transplant is the best option. So I'm going to give you some more uh, uh, justification why a transplant is ideal in end-stage renal disease. In olden days, when I started dialysis 40 years ago, only people who could afford dialysis were smugglers, politicians, ambassadors, and movie stars. Now things have changed. People can afford dialysis, but nevertheless, they itself had a lot of complications, starting from vomiting, hypotension and a lot of other things. But the modern dialysis, things have changed, quality has improved. But nevertheless, it can never match a God-given kidney, that is kidney transplantation. A person on dialysis has got diet restrictions. He cannot drink more than half a liter of fluid per day and he's tied to the machine. Even if you're a Santa Claus, you've got to be on the machine. So these are the problems on being on dialysis. So we suggest that when you compare transplant versus dialysis, transplant would be the best option. Even if you look at the uh, long, the uh, life, uh, life expectancy, look at this picture here. It compares live donor transplant, carrier transplant, and patient on dialysis. The green line is patient on dialysis. Look at the survival figures. Look at the person with the carrier transplant. It's far superior to being on dialysis. But the best option is a live donor transplant where the quality of life and longevity is far superior. Now, look at this picture again. Again, it gives you how it compares. You have a young man on dialysis, and you have an old man who is not on dialysis. They have similar life expectancy. So it again tells you that if you take 100 patients on dialysis today, at the end of 10 years, even in the best of centers, nearly 80% will be dead. Whereas with a transplantation, a 10-year survival is nearly 80%. Meaning that once you have a transplant, a successful transplant gives good quality of life. That is important. Also, the longevity. Once you look at the picture here, if you are on dialysis, it compares what is the number of years left. There's no question at all that anybody who's gone dialysis, if he goes for transplantation, the longevity and the quality of life improves. Again, this again tells you, uh, uh, my own colleague from uh, United States, Dr. Bargo Mistry, he did his MBBS from Karnataka. He keeps talking to me and he tells that the magical cure of kidney failure is kidney transplantation. And that's what Shakespeare also said, is it man of my kidney. So in my own awareness, when you look at the quality of life, what favors dialysis, what favors transplantation, definitely the graph is towards transplantation. Nothing like a successful transplant. So again, 
if you look at the long look at the quality of life there's no two things at all transplant is the best option in end stage renal disease having said that transplant is not all the time successful please understand transplant is not successful all the time the body can reject you can have infection now i always give the example of one of my favorite patients kamal shah this man you know he had kidney failure he went for a transplantation and he lost his kidney because of condition called hemolytic uremic syndrome he was on a medication called cyclosporin 20 years ago and that cyclosporin actually damaged his kidney and he lost his kidney uh, transplant kidney then what he did was he went on peritoneal dialysis he was doing very well on peritoneal dialysis and he was in a resort in chennai having a holiday and tsunami hit the city and he got nearly drowned and he had peritonitis and he couldn't continue the peritoneal dialysis then he went on machine dialysis the last 20 years or so he is on everyday home dialysis and in fact he now is the ceo of a company which is running on dialysis and this is actually you can see uh, brian perer our colleague of anupam agarwal and dr prakash keshav they are all well known nephrology figures and kamal shah here uh, on dialysis every day running a chain of dialysis unit till in spite of all that he is looking for a second transplant with a drug called ecuzumab which could help him in hemolytic uremic syndrome so to tell you the story that dialysis and transplant they are not competitive they are complementary to each other in fact dialysis in my opinion is a bridge for transplantation so if you look at again the same thing the quality of life and the longevity transplant scores over dialysis now when you talk of transplantation the transplant for somebody giving a kidney so you have a patient who is called the recipient and the kidney donor or the kidney comes from a dead person it can be an emotional related person as per indian law the spouse is emotional related or unrelated donor which could be a living unrelated donor like a friend or an altruistic donor or a cadaver donor or disease donor so this is the donor source now one common question people ask is in transplantation what we look at is blood group compatibility like i keep telling patients if you are a o group donor you are universal donor ab you are universal recipient so blood group compatibility is what is important in transplantation now we have got technology we have uh, drugs we can do what is called against blood group but that is not so easy but by and large in transplantation what we look at the donor is blood group compatibility so this again tells you in in brief how o group patient has to get a o group kidney a group can get from a or o a b group can get from b or o ab is universal recipient can get any blood group this is uh, in brief what is called as abo compatibility in kidney transplantation common question people keep asking is whether the old kidneys are remote please understand that the old kidneys are native kidneys they are not remote and the new kidney is normally placed in the right iliac fossa and sometimes we do keep it in the left iliac fossa people who had the first transplant if that failed the second kidney is kept in the left iliac fossa i have had patients who have got three transplants four transplants the surgeon decides where to keep the kidneys but by and large the old kidneys or the native kidneys are not this is an important fact you must understand now let me go to the history of transplantation this is a, a 1954 in boston where dr murray uh, who got the surgeon who got the uh, nobel prize actually did the transplant between identical twins so this is very important in a transplant as i told you rejection is one of the factors which we lose a graft in those days 54 they didn't have any immunosuppressive drugs and because they were identical twins the transplant success worked meaning there is no rejection now again i was very fortunate to be trained in cmc velour one of the first centers to start dialysis in india in 1962 and 1971 they did the india's first full transplantation so i pay respect to my guru who are there in the photograph here so 1991 the first transplant successful transplant in cmc velo now when you talk of transplantation in india by and large donor majority is live donor so when you talk of live donor is it justified to take a kidney from a person who is live is it correct what is the justification one is a live transplant is a planned procedure and the patient is on dialysis for a short period of better preparation better graft survival also you must understand the donation itself carries some risk negligible risk 
but there is a risk. So proper counseling is needed, proper evaluation is needed. The kidney donor is doing a service. He or she is going through a major surgery for the benefit of somebody who's loved one. So we have to be very careful when you assess a kidney donor. Now, when you look at the other source of donor, we call cadaver. Now the term is called disease donor. This again comes from what is called as heart beating brain dead donor. So some of the times when you talk of cadaver donors, a lot of lay people think that you can take the kidney from anybody who is dead. In fact, the earlier law, you'd be surprised to know, the Indian law had a term. You can take the organ from any unclaimed body for three days, which is a ridiculous law. You can't take any organ, somebody whose body has been there dead for three days. That is now changed. Nevertheless, you must understand when I talk of cadaver transplant or disease donor transplant, it is invariably a brain dead heart cadaver. It most often it is a road accident, either a motorcycle accident or a car accident where they have had a brain stem death and all other organs are working, then it could take the kidney. This is called a disease donor transplantation. This again tells you the source of the uh, disease donor by and large are road accidents. In fact, if you look at Western countries, New Year Eve, Christmas Eve, where the accidents occur more, the donors are more. So that is one of the things. But with better seat belt, better car, even the disease donor numbers are coming down. In a country like India, we have a lot of accidents. The number, I think we have the highest number of road traffic accidents. But unfortunately, these cannot be the source of organs because many of these accidents, the, the, the actual victim is actually crushed. It's not head injury. They're either crushed by crossing the road or some other reason, they could not be donors. That is one reason why the caravan transplant is still yet to pick up in India. The other reason is the attachment to the, the body. In Indian tradition, we are more attached to that body than the person who's living. So that concept has to change. All religions now talk of cadaver donor. They also talk of religions allowing people to take organ from brain dead persons. That is important. Now, this is how a human organ is trans transported between uh, cities, between uh, continents. But my own experience, we did the first cadaver transplant about 25 years ago. And this actually, you can see me taking the kidney from St. John's Medical College, the ladies, uh, Dr. Rebecca Thomas, the transplant coordinator of uh, St. John, she's actually giving me handing over a kidney in a thermocol box. And I, actually, I took the kidney in my car to another hospital and we did the transplant. This kidney worked for eight to 10 years very well. So those days we didn't have something called green corridor to transport the organs. But now things have changed. The awareness has increased. We have got what is called a green corridor. The organs can go from uh, one city to another, either by aircraft or by ambulance, by road. And people are getting into the picture of what is organ donor, what is disease donor. And we have got movies, we have got the media, which has to play in, in this form of donation. Now, uh, this again, uh, I would pay, like to pay respects to the, the Indian transplant team. Here, Dr. Johnny and Dr. Mohan Rao. These are two people who did the first transplant in TMC Valor in 1972. I had the opportunity of honoring them with the uh, Minister Vaila Ravi in 2007 in a conference in Bangalore. We gave them the Lifetime Achievement Award to Dr. Mohan Rao and Dr. K. V. Johnny, who did India's first transplantation. Now let's look at the survival figures. As I told you, the survival figure, the one year survival in transplant is 95% and the 10 years is about 40%. This is my own figure, but these are very old figures. A 25 year survival is about 8%. But nevertheless, if you look at the transplant program, how it evolved in my state. We did the first transplant in 1983, and over the last 35 years, we have done lots of transplants. There are very uh, many centers, even in Bangalore, we have got about 10 centers which are doing transplantation. Now, one in, in transplant is a question which is asked the drugs given to the patient is lifelong. Please understand. A person who was transplanted, he is on lifelong immunosuppression, and this costs money. And if you look at the evolution of transplant, the earliest the medication used was what is called as azathioprine and prednisolone. I was trained in an era what is called as BC era, that is before cyclosporine era. You must understand one drug which actually changed the entire scenario of transplantation is sandimune or cyclosporine. So that is why I call it before cyclosporine era and after cyclosporine era. The picture you see here is my senior colleague, Dr. Tyagarajan, who was the first to use cyclosporine in India, and the chief minister, 
M. G. Ramachandran, who went to U. S. and had an unrelated transplant. This is one drug which actually changed the concept of transplantation. In fact, the use of unrelated donor, totally unrelated donor, the organ sale actually came in because of cyclosporin. You can say that way. Cyclosporin is a miracle drug which did two things. You could do transplant from donors who are not related, and the ethics of unrelated transplant payment. Four organs came in. I will talk to them on that later. But this drug, cyclosporin, changed the story of transplantation. Now, my own protocol over the last 35 years, I started out in the before cyclosporin era. I was using only azathioprine and prednisolone. Then I started using cyclosporin, azathioprine, and prednisolone. Now, the current uh, regimen which we use, and this is all accepted over the world, is tacrolimus. Mycophenolate and prednisolone. Nearly 90% of my transplant now are on these three drugs: tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and prednisolone. Now, when you talk of transplantation, I am telling you only the good things of transplant. Transplant the, the good side and the bad side. One of the bad side of transplant is the drug toxicity. When you are on various drugs, all drugs have got side effects. Please understand: any drug which has got to have an effect will have side side effect. Homeopathy has no side effect because it has no effect. Any drug which has got effect will have side side effect. If you look at all transplant medicines; they have some side effect. And one of the problems of cyclosporin, which I always found, was gingival hypertrophy. And once I switched from cyclosporin to tacrolimus, this cosmetic change occurred. And this is so in ladies. If you look at this picture here on the left, this lady here on cyclosporin had a lot of hirsutism. And once we switched over the tacrolimus, this hirsutism disappears. And uh, this is again, uh, those of you who know Selena Gomez, she is on actually tacrolimus. She had lupus nephritis and a transplant from an unrelated donor. This is again my own patient, two transplantation from an unrelated on tacrolimus. Again, cosmetically, tacrolimus is a better drug compared to cyclosporin. Now, look at the cost of therapy. My friend Vijay K, uh, very senior nephrologist, has done a cost. The cost of transplant, not the actual cost of transplant in the hospital. It is what is called post-transplant cost. The cost varies. Again, it depends on what drugs you are using. Again, this gives you in dollars. Roughly, if you keep a patient on azathioprine, tacrolimus, and steroids, it is thousand five hundred dollars a year. But if you are on these three drugs, it will cost you two hundred dollars a year. This is a large amount of money for a country like India. Two thousand five hundred dollars a year is quite large. So unless the government or insurance comes in, it is not easy for patients to manage. And one of the reasons the transplant kidney fails in India is the cost factor. Once they know they cannot afford the treatment, they stop the drugs. The kidney to kidneys reject once you stop these medications, and they again on dialysis. So it's imperative proper counseling, not only about medication, but also on the cost factor is important in a country like India. So these are some of my success stories. And uh, this is again a police commissioner who had transplant going back to normal. This again uh, tells you some of the success stories from Africa who came to us for transplant doing well. Now, one other question which is asked is, person who had transplant can they have children? Children, they, ladies, the women go through pregnancy. It's not an easy pregnancy, but I have had quite a few ladies who have got pregnant and had transplant. For a man, it's not an issue. This is a Islamic scholar from Nigeria. He had transplant. After transplant, we married four times and produced eight children. So it is possible to have a transplant and have a normal married life and normal children, which is not easy for dialysis. This again tells you a story of my uh, favorite patient, Rajini, who came from, uh, who had a transplant with me, then went to migrate to Australia, and she had twins after that. But the, the pregnancy was a high pregnancy. She had postpartum hemorrhage, but she was very well managed in Sydney. And now these are, photo was taken just uh, last month. The two girls who are grown up having twins. So with transplantation, it is possible to have children, but it is high risk pregnancy, and the pregnancy has to be done in a center where high risk pregnancy can be taken care of. Then these are some of my patients who have come back for follow up, doing well on transplantation. Now one other important question which is asked is, is there a limitation of age? At what age do you do transplantation? My youngest has been four years old, five years old from Malaysia. She, this is 30 years ago. She's still doing well after transplant. My oldest was 85. This man, a politician, 85 year old, for transplantation. So age per se 
is not a contraindication. If you are medically fit, it is a chronological. Hello, Sundar, we are not able to hear. Dr. Sundar. Hello, Sundar. That is our mistake. Sir, we are unable to hear. Hello. Sir, we are unable to hear. Hello? Sir, it's audible now, sir. It's audible now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. But I'm not able to move the slides. I'm not able to move the slides. Can you help me? Hello? Sir, can you accept? No, you try. Huh? No, you try. Sir. I'm not able to move the slide. Sir, can you close PowerPoint presentation? Pardon? Sir, can you close the PowerPoint presentation and reopen it? Ah, yes, okay. Close it, okay. Yeah. How do I close it now? Hmm? Okay. Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, now, sir. This is again uh, to how uh, the uh, National Basketball Association, Alon Zumodi, is a famous basketball player who had transplant and went back to play active basketball. And you can see me actually taking autograph from Alon Zumodi in Boston. This again tells you my own uh, colleague, a neurosurgeon, who had a transplant. The kidney was donated by his brother. He's back to playing not only uh, active neurosurgeon, but playing golf in a professional level. He won many gold medals in the transplant game. So it is possible to lead a normal life. This is, a, again, an interesting story where two transplant recipients got married and their children living a normal life. So these are some of the success stories. But please understand, transplant is not all the time uh, rosy. Transplant is like marriage. Marriage is a blessing for many, curse for some, but a risk for all. It's an old Scottish saying by Sir Douglas Black. A well known Scottish nephrologist. So, if your kidney works well, it's a blessing. But if you've got kidney rejection or infection, it can be a curse. But you've got to take the risk of transplantation, just like marriage. Now, one of the important things in transplantation is the ethical and legal issues. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this. India, there's a transplant law. And if you look at a Google search on transplant law, this shows you many cases involving me. Either I have filed a case on somebody or somebody has filed a case on me. So unless you have a good legal team in transplantation in India, it is not possible to do. So in our own hospital, we have got an excellent legal system. And this again tells you how 
in 1995, we are in Bangalore, so-called kidney transplant scam. We were accused of stealing kidneys and the entire transplant program paralyzed. And it took a long time for the transplant to pick up. Now, this again is a problem which uh, people are, don't, uh, uh, don't address. And this Human Organ Transplant Act was passed in 1994. It, three aspects of the law was important. It, it redefined brain death so that cadaver transplant can go on. It also said how there is shortage of organs, how the family should come forward and donate. One other thing it made was it made organ sale an offense. So when you have such loss, we had this ethical dilemma in a patient who had kidney failure and his only donor was his own brother with 100% match, but he was different now. The question was, he cannot give consent whether he could take his kidney and go ahead with the transplant. We had a tough time. We went to the court. With a court order, we did transplant. It is now 25 years. Both the donor and the superior are doing well. We have not any other transplant involving such a donor in the last 25 years. But some of the issues are very, uh, uh, what is it, contentious. There are people who support us, people don't support us. But after this episode, we were in the headlines of most important journals, newspaper. Some of them said what we did was right. Some said what we did was not correct. Nevertheless, I don't regret it because it is uh, been rewarded. But the question is, what is ethics? How do you define ethics? So it's not easy. Again, we had this Jehovah's witness who came to me for transplant. He said that he cannot take any blood if there is bleeding, he's ready to die. Our surgeon said, I will go ahead with the transplant, and they did well. But the question is, is it ethical? So ethics is something which is uh, very important in transplant, and it varies from place to place, person to person. And this again, during the 95 Act, when the Act was passed, a grandfather wanted to donate to grandson. As per Indian law, the grandfather at that time was not considered related. Now, recently, we included grandfather in the list of relations. And this man actually went to court, argued himself, saying that I want to donate kidney to my grandson and save his life. And with a court order, we did the transplant. So again, it tells you how it is important to have a legal system to protect you when you do transplantation. So one of the problems we have is organ shortage. That is the cause of so-called kidney scams. When there is shortage of organs, then there is demand for supply. It is like drugs. But if you, when you have uh, the supply is less, then a lot of illegal things could go on. So it's very important to follow the law. And how do we increase the organ source? One is cadaver transplant, I already told you. The other is what is called a swap transplantation. When there is no blood group match between the donor and the recipient, we do swap transplant or domino transplant, which is just catching up in India. And slowly, I think things would change and we'll have more transplantation. And the other thing is what is called as ABO incompatible transplant, where we are able to do uh, against blood group. Now, this again is in, which keeps coming in every organ transplant forum in India, all over the world, whether we should pay for an organ. It's not an easy question. So the question is whether we should allow the patient to die or buy a kidney. This has been going on for the last 30 years. There is no system or no where, where we can go this way or that way. But in Singapore, what they did was they sort of list the unrelated transplant. They said any donor who donates kidney will be paid money by the government. It's not organ sales. It is not saying going to the market and saying I'll buy an organ. Now there are a lot of issues even in the United States where the discussion go on. I'm sure Anupam will also be able to add to this ethics whether some sort of compensation should be given to the donor who donates the kidney. Whether it should be only altruism or some incentive in the form of tax cut or uh, what to say some sort of award to the donor so the donor has got feeling that he has done something and the benefits out of it. It's not an easy question, and the media and the people have to decide whether such a thing should be allowed. Uh, Martin actually talked on the latest research on cloned kidneys, and in fact, Dr. Balal, my chairman, runs a company called Stemputics. They are talking about uh, regenerating the kidney. Things are going on. We are talking of xenotransplant, where your pigs with human genes called transgenic pigs we could use, but these I don't know how long it's going to take. But nevertheless, for the sake of completion, I'm telling you that there is some hope in this form of therapy. We don't know when this is going to come in. Now, uh, a country like India cannot afford dialysis or transplantation. So I would like to quote Dr. Mani and my guru, Dr. B. M. Agri, who said, Swastha se swastha rakshita, keep the well healthy. That is prevention. And very nicely, um, Dr. Martin and my good friend Raghavendra, but very nicely put it, how preventing CKD is more important than actually 
doing dialysis and transplant. No country, whether it's America or India, can actually afford to treat the millions of people with end-stage renal disease. So the key is prevention. And uh, one of the questions which keeps coming is, what is the exact role of a nephrologist in transplant patients? It was actually taken about 30 years ago, me doing prayers for uh, when the surgeon is operating. And because of the prayers, the patient does well. And I would like to acknowledge the work of uh, my uh, robotic and transplant surgeon, Dr. Dubey, our chairman, a renowned nephrologist, and my good friend, also from Manipal. Uh, actually, he happens to be a classmate of Dr. Guru Madhav Rao. Dr. Balal told me to convey the regard to you, sir. So this, all of them were able to do some good work in Manipal Hospital. And the aim in life for a nephrologist is to see urine. More urine you see, that is best for us. And this is some of the cartoons which we keep showing how urine is important for us. And I end with the last slide. Uh, I love you with all my kidneys. This is what we should say. We say, I love you with my heart. You can't donate a heart to your girlfriend or a wife or spouse, but you could definitely donate a kidney to your loved one. In fact, my famous uh, quotation, I keep uh, patients asking me, why has God given us two kidneys? I keep saying, one is for you, one is for donating to your loved one. With this, I think I would end and we could go for uh, the discussion. And this is my, again, last slide, which tells you from Devadat Naik, a famous uh, anesthetist and a writer. He says, what is truth? Who sees it? Varuna has a thousand eyes, Indra a hundred, you and I only two. So what I look at truth, what I look at ethics may vary from place to place, person to person. Thank you. I thank the organizers for giving me a chance to discuss my own experience in the field of transplantation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sundar, for sharing your experience and enlightening us on renal transplant. You have completed all the three talks. As mentioned earlier, all the questions will be answered during the panel discussion. Without further delay, I invite Dr. Martin and Dr. Rakhavindra Bhatt to moderate our next session, which is the panel discussion. Thank you, everyone. Video. 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 This is. It is my great privilege to be able to introduce one of my best good students, Anupam Agarwal. He is now the executive. He is director of the Division of Nephrology and executive vice dean of the School of Medicine at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He is the program director of the NIH and NIDDK for, uh, for the O'Brien Center for Acute Kidney Injury Research. And most importantly, he is the president of the National uh, American Society of Nephrology. As a teacher in the beginning of my career, he was in the beginning of his student career, he was the son of a beloved pathology professor. We looked up to him, we expected something from him when he was taking a lot of interest in discussions. He was coming out with difficult questions for us. And this continued as expected. He went on to bag all possible medals and awards on the way. He got the best student, outgoing student award for MBBS and the blue ribbon for the best outgoing student. Then he got the gold medal for MD, DM, and a lot of fellowships in United States. And the story went on. Most importantly, he was able to teach, read, and be in the research, doing excellent in all the three arms a person can. And recently, two years ago, he went on to get a grant of $5.67 million. Yes, my friends, you heard it right. A huge grant from the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases for collaborative research in acute kidney injury with the UC San Diego School of Medicine. He now is the president of the American College of Nephrology, and which is a very important policy-making body for the renal diseases. He has given immense happiness to his parents and his teachers by climbing the ladder of success, run by run, and he has climbed more than climbed many ranks. He has climbed more than many ranks, more than other many ranks of teachers. We assure you, Dr. Agarwal, we will continue as teachers, continue as teachers, and we will claim you further, and we will be happy with your family. I'm, I now introduce Dr. Shankar Sundra. He is my one of my closest friends. He started his academic career as a brilliant entrant into the PPC, where he was one of the top arts. 
went on to do his MBBS, MD, and then DMB at one of the most prestigious centers, which started transplant actually, well known. He evolved in nephrology. His greatest luck is that India nephrology came up and killed him, and he had many firsts to his credit, including being able to set up transplant centers in many of these places, most important being MS Ramayya. Something special about him, you ask him for either see a patient, get a transplant done, take a class, take a lecture, come online, he has never said no. He has led his team for three and a half thousand transplants, which is a tremendous achievement internationally. When we greet our patient, one person greets us back. When he greets his patient, two people greet him back. One, the visible recipient, and one, the invisible donor who made it all possible. Whichever corner of the world he goes to, he is sure to find a patient welcoming him with open arms with his family. Currently, he is the transplant consultant at the Manipal Hospital in Bangalore and editing faculty at the Kasuba Medical College, Manipal. Thank you very much. Dr. Bhatt, did you want us to answer any questions from the audience or? Can't hear. Hello, yeah, sorry. Uh, I would just like to introduce our two other uh, uh, panelists and then we'll go into our question and answer session. Uh, I would like to introduce my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Esavi, Dr. Abdul Bas Esavi, who is, uh, who is my colleague in the Department of Nephrology at Obedullah Hospital, Ras al uh, Dr. Esavi is also the head of the Department of Nephrology here. Uh, he's the consultant nephrologist under the Ministry of Health. Uh, Dr. Esavi, is, uh, he also has the job of Associate Dean of the RAC, uh, uh, RAC Medical Health Sciences University, Rasa Kaima. And uh, I will, uh, in fact, uh, we are colleagues and we see each other daily, but right now I am seeing him across, across the seven seas in another continent in the US. Hi, Dr. Esavi, at another time zone. Uh, he would probably be joining us after his vacation there. He is a leading academician and has uh, has uh, uh, his main uh, uh, academics is uh, running or maintaining regular uh, medical CMEs uh, here. We get a lot of leading uh, um, academicians from the US, from Europe, and other parts of the world in giving us state-of-the-art talks. In fact, uh, I look forward sometime in future through Dr. Esavi, uh, for Dr. Anupam Magarwal and Dr. S. Sundar to come along and give us some talks for CME. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Esavi. Now I welcome my senior colleague, uh, Dr. El Hadi, who has as a very young nephrologist many years back, he was one of my godfathers and very good advisor. Uh, I look upon him as a very respected and learned clinician who has many, many years of work and clinical experience under his belt. He has been a nephrologist and, uh, and uh, consultant and head of Department of Medicine at Obeidullah Hospital in the Ministry of Health uh, for many years. And now he continues as a consultant at uh, Raq Hospital. Uh, thank you, Dr. El Hadi, for joining us. And we look forward to your wisdom and uh, your uh, contribution in this discussion. We go ahead with the question and answers. Uh, what uh, just a little bit of housekeeping what I would like to do is I'm already getting quite a lot of questions uh, from 
uh, the uh, the registered uh, candidates so what i would do is i would probably uh, uh, just start off with the question with dr anupam agarwal and then i would go on to the others i would just name and then go on and then you are free to answer your your questions the first question i direct to dr anupam uh, there is a question which says uh, should we treat hyperuricemia in ckd patients this is in fact from a primary care physician yeah thank you for that question and before i answer that question i want to also um, really acknowledge my appreciation for the invitation to participate on this panel uh, it's really an honor to have the floor with uh, people like dr butt who taught me in medical school uh, sundar who uh, when i was in high school i remember um, you know we used to live close to the hostel where kasturba medical college uh, hostel in kapri gudda in mangalore used to be and i used to aspire going to medical school at some day so uh, they played a major role in influencing my decision to pursue medicine so i uh, really thank you it brings back uh, fond memories of uh, my days in 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 mangalore so thank you very much um going to a question about hyperuricemia in in uh, uh, chronic kidney disease patients you know that is a uh, it, it's a question uh, you know if it's you have to look at the symptoms the level of hyperuricemia uh, and then determine whether or not to treat because the medications we have at least you know there are newer medications now which are quite good but the medications for example allopurinol and so on you know you may have some toxicity if you have underlying uh, you know kidney failure on the bone marrow uh, so you have to be careful using such agents if it's mildly elevated levels of hyperuricemia normally we would not treat that uh, you know if the patient is on dialysis you know the uric acid gets taken care of uh, by dialysis and obviously transplant would reverse hyperuricemia as well uh, but if it's severe symptomatic hyperuricemia to the point that the patient is experiencing gout or symptoms of gout clearly we recommend uh, you know treating that just like you would treat a patient with gout and hyperuricemia with the modifications of the drug but the newer medications like rasuricase and so on are important there's also evidence you know uh, dr richard johnson uh, from university of colorado has shown very nicely that actually hyperuricemia if left uncontrolled in stage 2 or 3 ckd can actually worsen ckd so clearly controlling hyperuricemia may be important in those patients as well so so each patient you know you have to individualize the therapy it just cannot be the level you have to look at the symptoms and so on and then then treat accordingly thank you dr anupam uh, i now direct uh, the question to dr el hadi uh, there is an interesting question uh, i think uh, uh, regarding your seniority and lots of years of experience it just asks you your experience as a senior nephrologist in uae you're free to give a few points on what you have seen as far as kidney disease is concerned in the uae yeah uh, thank you very much let me start by thanking the organizer for inviting me and being you know part of this distinguished panel well the truth of the matter i have prepared some slides you know about you know which could be related even to this question okay about chronic kidney disease in developing countries because we know okay if you spoke about and i'm, I'm sure uae is a rich country but it's still a developing country okay health wise and development wise so in developing countries okay long time before the emphasis was on non-communicable diseases sorry, on, on communicable disease, like infections, okay, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, and those things. When I came to the UAE, which is 30 years ago, okay, dialysis was scarce, okay, and at that time, maybe we had the dilemma of, or the ethical dilemma of treating patients, whom should you treat? Because if it are faced with a patient with chronic kidney disease, and they say kidney disease, well, chronic kidney disease at that time, okay, we had very little things to do. As you said, just treating diabetes, okay, maybe treating hypertension. But if you are faced with a patient with end stage kidney disease who needed dialysis, then you may have had to transfer him somewhere. 
And the only places where we had the entities in the UAE were Abu Dhabi and Dubai later. And then in Ras al Khaimah, we started the analysis, maybe, I don't think, I can't recall exactly the timing, but maybe around 25 years ago. And the first two patients we had, we borrowed them from Dubai. They were Ras Khaimah patients who had been dialyzed in Dubai. And at that time, as you said, okay, most of the patients would come to you as the last stage, okay, when they need dialysis in pulmonary edema with severe hyperkalemia, and then you had to rush them for dialysis. And I have seen those days where midnight would be called to see a patient with pulmonary edema, severe hyperkalemia, then you have to put a catheter in, okay, and used to put the catheter on, on our own, okay, put the catheter in and dialyze in midnight. Uh, that was the case. And at that time, again, I would say, which is the case still in developing countries, the main causes of endosecond disease were not known to us. And a lot of patients had, you know, Glomerular nephritis, even obstructive neuropathy, which I think maybe if, if you have a patient with obstructive neuropathy, I think leaving him to go into any secondary disease may be account to almost a crime nowadays. But in developing countries, you know that you know obstructive neuropathy, interstitial nephritis, glomerular nephritis are high. And then I have seen the time when diabetes has taken over. And I think the last thing I did in, 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 in safe hospital, okay, I was looking at my patients and I had 45% of my patients were diabetic. To the son that said that, you know, 50% of his patients in India are diabetics. But again, if you look into the literature before, if you go to India, okay, around most of the patients at that time were, were glomerulophytis, interstitial nephritis and obstruction. Diabetes were continuing a little, but diabetes is taking over and we have seen the time when diabetes and hypertension are the main cause of endosecond disease. And then we have seen the widespread dialysis centers in all over the MRS. Every MRS has got its own, you know, government and private centers where every patient could be dialyzed. And the ethical dilemma of whom to dialyze has come to, because I remember even, you know, long time before that in UK, a patient comes to you above the age of 50. Well, he's not for dialysis. And then, as even in this country, we have seen, seen, seen that, shall we send this patient for dialysis or shall we leave him alone to die or do nothing as Dr. Butt said? But now I think that is not the case over here. Thank you. Dr. Martin, can you unmute your microphone? Sorry, I forgot to unmute my mic. Thank you, Dr. Yes. El Hadi, for giving your ex early experience in the UAE. Now I direct my question to Dr. Esawi. There is a question from, I think, from a primary care physician. If you can just highlight what are the drugs which can make CKD worse? I'm just quoting the question. What are the drugs which can make CKD worse? Uh, I, I, I'm sure you agree that in our experience, we come across quite a lot of these drugs. Uh, could you uh, recount or could you just tell us a few in a few words? Unmute, unmute. Dr. Esavi, you have to unmute. Dr. Esavi, you'll have to unmute. Uh, you have to unmute. Do you hear me like this? Ah, uh, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, maybe uh, my. You hear? No, you have gone off again. I think you'll have to press the unmute uh, button. Since my uh, my uh, headphone is not working properly, 
So regarding it, I already during the speaker talks, giving their talks, I prepared also a few slides to complete. From my point of view, uh, some of points should be highlighted uh, because we have a lot of audience who are uh, medical students, primary care and non-nephrologists. So I prepared a few slides. If you allow me at the, at the end, I can present them. Uh, regarding your question is uh, what kind of medication would make kidney disease worse? Uh, uh, we have to categorize this medication. First of all, we have a group of medication which can make a healthy kidney a diseased kidney. And we have some medication which can, uh, uh, I mean, can cause acute kidney injury or can make cause a chronic kidney injury. And we have some medication which can worsen uh, the chronic kidney injury itself. So the medication which can convert a healthy kidney to a diseased kidney, either in terms of interstitial nephritis and unseen until late or acute kidney injury is the most important than non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. So uh, this non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug might have different effect, hemodynamic effects. So this can cause acute kidney injury, especially using, we see it in, uh, we saw it in our practice many times that people give diclofenac injection for killing pain and the people come afterward by acute kidney injury. Uh, Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, which is less intense compared to the diclofenac, can cause interstitial, chronic interstitial nephritis, uh, and they can cause minimally change the disease. And they found this in uh, autopsy uh, uh, if the early discovery of the effect of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug on the kidney uh, uh, in Swiss uh, watchmen after they died because they all they used to use a uh, treatment for headache. And when they uh, do autopsy for zinc kidney, they would they found a small sized kidney with interstitial fibrosis. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory is killing the kidney in acute way by hemodynamic effect, and in chronic way using chronic interstitial nephritis and chronic kidney disease. The most dangerous, and especially in the Middle East, abuse of drugs that everyone using even without pres prescription is antibiotic. We have a group of antibiotics which are very nephrotoxic and can cause acute interstitial nephritis and acute tubular necrosis, especially the aminoglycoside group, uh, mainly amicacin and gentamicin and uh, some other medication. We have also some antifungal like amphotericin B. It is very nephrotoxic. Also, we have some medication which we use to treat a slow progression of kidney disease like ACA inhibitor ARBs. This medication when it is used to in combination with uh, diuretics, you know, uh, this medication, as you, Dr. Martin, explained kindly in your talk, cause uh, decreased uh, slow progression of kidney disease through uh, dilatation of the efferent arteriole, which lead to increase, decrease in intraglomerular pressure. Using of diuretic in association with this medication sometimes uh, uh, will lead to uh, uh, decrease also the amount of blood going to the efferent arteriole with failures of decrease in intraglomerular pressure. And this is called, can cause even acute kidney injury or acute renal shutdown, especially with people who might doesn't have kidney injury but have renal artery stenosis are uh, treated by ACA inhibitor itself. If you add ACA inhibitor, it can cause acute kidney injury. This is the most famous drug uh, can cause uh, are nephrotoxic and are in common use uh, in the practice. Of course, there are many other drugs uh, less common, like the chemotherapeutic agent, which are nephrotoxic uh, extra. There are many other agents, but the, I call the most important non steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, uh, antibiotic combination of AC inhibitor ARBs uh, with diuretic in a patient who have uh, a low ejection fraction. Thank you, Dr. Asabi. Uh, I now direct a question to our esteemed colleague, Dr. Sunda, who has uh, so many thousands of transplant experience. Uh, uh, there's an interesting question. Uh, some patients after transplant are not taking immunosuppressive drugs. Now, we not for a moment, not even for a small moment, your message, which has clearly come across is that immunosuppression for, for life that has that message has to be there but there is an interesting observation by one of the one of the per person who is hearing 
that some patients he has been hearing are not taking immunosuppressive drugs after many years of transplant. Why, Dr. Sundar? Uh, I think one is uh, cost. Uh, at least in India, it's mainly because of the cost factor because you have to spend a lot of money for the drugs. So they feel that they're doing well. Why should I take the medicine? Other is, I think, sheer uh, sort of uh, complicated. They, I would say, I, I don't know what to use the word arrogance. They feel they're doing well. In fact, I'm still at this time, a story. I had a patient from Nigeria. He had his transplant. Within a few years, he came to me with a graft failure. So I asked him, are you taking your drugs? You know what he said? No, I stopped the drugs. I said, why did you stop? Jesus told me to stop. I did the transplant. He came back again after four years, five years, again with a graft failure. And the same story, again, I asked him, did you stop the medicine? Yes. And he said, why did you stop? Jesus told me to stop. Then we did the third transplant. And then I told him, this time, even if Jesus tells you to stop, you should not stop till I tell you to stop. Now it is 10 years of doing well. So these are various stories are there. But by and large, if the transplant patient has not taken drugs, and I have one or two, they have stopped all medicines, is 25, 30 years doing well. I think some sort of tolerance and God's grace, that's what I would say. But I would not recommend anybody to stop immunosuppression. Definitely, it is, in my opinion, lifelong. So they can, they have to meet the concerned doctor, be on follow-up. In fact, I keep telling my patient that they are married to me for life. It's an unhappy marriage, but they are married to the transplant team. That's the way it is. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Sundar. Uh, the next question is to Dr. Anupam. Uh, Dr. Anupam, uh, you are uh, uh, now officially leading one of the most important organizations in the world uh, regarding nephrology. And uh, the primary one of the primary care clinician is asking, uh, in a few words, uh, what is the message to primary care physicians across the world from you? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the American Society of Nephrology in the last uh, few years has really focused attention on primary care as well as family care, you know, physicians, because we think chronic kidney disease, really, we have to aim at prevention. It's not only hypertension and diabetes, which, as you heard, are the leading causes of chronic kidney disease, but we need help from our primary care colleagues. Fortunately, there are newer drugs on the horizon, and um, you spoke about, uh, you know, the SGLT2 inhibitors, the endothelin antagonists, a lot of new drugs coming in. Some of them will actually be presented next month at our ASN Kidney Week Reimagine. So I would encourage you all to, you know, register and attend those meetings um, next month. Huge uh, findings, not only in diabetic kidney disease, but also in non-diabetic kidney disease, these drugs, SGLT2 inhibitors, have profound effects in slowing progression of kidney disease. Getting a few months, a few years off of dialysis or being on a transplant wait list is huge for our patients. And at least in the US, last year, the feds signed an executive order. The only executive order focused on a disease on an organ system. There have been over 15,000 of these signed over the years but this is the only one focused on kidney disease. And one of the main tenets of this is, can we slow progression of kidney disease for stage four, stage five, and delay dialysis uh, or transplant? And if we can do that, there'll be significant incentive payments for the physician taking care of those patients. So I think trying to help, so the ASN is working very closely with national, international societies of primary care, family practice in enlightening them on how to use these drugs. Uh, how do we, you know, clearly everybody does diet, blood pressure and blood sugar control, but using these newer agents, we really need help from our primary care physicians uh, to really reduce the burden. As, you know, somebody said, there are 850 million people worldwide with chronic kidney disease. That is a huge number, uh, you know, really one tenth of the world's population. So. Uh, so we really have to act and act now, you know, to slow the progression. Thank you, Dr. Anupam. Uh, Dr. El Hadi, there is a, pri a primary care physician who is asking that uh, you're one of the 
busiest clinicians in in the city today and uh, i also personally wonder how you've got time to spend time with us in your as a, you have taking time away from your busy practice the question is simple if a patient coming to you with diabetes and can afford his medications what are those or what are the drugs in your armamentarium uh, he has no problem with the finances what drugs would you give yeah well uh, in treatment of 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 diabetes chronic kidney disease okay we have two drugs which are you know proven to have you know to slow progression uh, the first one which has been you know long time before is the renin blockers and we know about the renal study idnt study which showed you know those drugs reduce proteinuria and slow progression the second one which have come recently is sgl2 and as dr uh, adupana was saying okay it it, it 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 helps in diabetic and non-diabetic kidney disease because the studies especially with DABA, was in both diabetic and non-diabetic. And a patient with diabetes, okay, and chronic kidney disease, okay, if he has proteinuria, he has to be on a renin blocker. But any diabetic with chronic kidney disease, where his EGFR can allow us to use SGL2, by guideline should be on SGL2. Because the guideline says, okay, if you have a patient, with chronic kidney disease, a diabetic chronic kidney disease, he has to be on an SGL2 inhibitor first, if he has chronic kidney disease. If his EGFR allows, if that's not the case, then he should be on a GLP-1. So for treatment of diabetes, either an SGL2, first option, or a GLP-1, because again, GLP-1s have shown, you know, a lot of benefits on kidney disease and proteinuria. So running blockers, okay, ARBs and S inhibitors, and SGL2 and second GLP1. Thank you, Dr. El Hadi. Uh, Dr. El Hadi, there's a question. Uh, there's a question from one of the participants. His relative is having chronic kidney disease stage five. Uh, he is doing his dialysis in Dubai. However, he wants to travel to Europe, he has the insurance, he's a businessman. He wants to stay in Europe for a couple of weeks and come back. How should he go about it? Well, this took me, may, took me uh, many years back when I was working in Maadi Armed Forces Hospital in Cairo, when I established what is called uh, 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 National, Tourist, uh, National uh, Tourist Dialysis Program. Uh, what I did in this, and I take the patient, you know, the, 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 the Egyptian army have many hospitals everywhere in the country. So in summertime, with the weather is hot in Cairo, and we have in the Mahadi Armed Forces Hospital, there are many hospitals in Alexandria. So we used to, to take the patient uh, uh, and take 10 days off. They give us a part, military apartment on the beach, and we take the patient to dialyze in Alexandria and enjoy the summer holiday. So this is with local experience, but came over the, all over the world later on, or later on, tourist dialysis where the people can travel with arranging their dialysis overseas with any uh, 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 local dialysis acknowledged a center which can accept the foreigner after undergoing uh, uh, repeating the necessary investigation like uh, hepatitis marker and HIV. And uh, if the center accepts, they can spend their time there and doing the dialysis in the center in that country. I did this in Egypt, and this when I was working in France, uh, there are too many patient French who travel worldwide, especially in Los Angeles uh, uh, area with Dr. Aswat. I don't know if any of the audience know him. He established the, uh, the tourist dialysis between France and the U.S. So any dialysis center overseas can be organized, uh, can be contacted by the, the home dialysis center of the patient send him uh, the dialysis prescription, with him the dialysis prescription, book a time, and he can do dialysis overseas. Thank you, Dr. Savi. Uh, Dr. Sundar, the current uh, transplant scenario in India, uh, we cannot talk about the transplant scenario without your name being mentioned, uh, because you have been involved in, 
in in the numbers and uh, the now the question one one has, some uh, someone has asked after the registration is that uh, in the covid scenario uh, what are the practical difficulties that you are facing uh, regarding your transplantation program uh, in fact we have had a, a lot of discussion and webinars on uh, whether to go ahead with the transplant or not actually the lockdown started in india in the month of march and uh, in the march and april we just did only one or two transplants normally we do about 10 to 12 transplants a month now our center did one or two we are worried because the patients are worried we are worried and uh, it is not an easy scenario in fact uh, dr sandeep guleria from delhi tells me that in delhi they had done 13 transplant and they lost five due to covid but at the same time uh, coming for dialysis is also not easy because uh, that itself is there is they are prone to COVID. The patients are worried. So we have now taken a policy that we will do transplants. We will not deny transplants, but we will do COVID screening for the donor recipient. We'll take a special consent and we'll take all precautions and go out of the transplant. These are all living donor transplant. The last five months we have had only one disease donor transplant. Only recently we had one uh, disease donor last last week. We restarted. It is a difficult scenario. It's not easy and uh, in the last few months, 25 of our patients who had transplant developed COVID, and we lost uh, only one, and we managed them well. So it is not an easy decision. And uh, if they are if they are doing well, I think the American Society has got some guidelines. Indian Society, we also got guidelines. By and large, if they are doing well on dialysis, we could wait. We would wait. But if somebody is really desperate, we have parameters. We follow the parameters, protocols, and go out with the transplant. That's what we are doing. And we are also careful with the induction. We are not using high dose induction like thymoglobulin. We are using more basiliximab, low dose. That we are going like that, and then uh, we are doing the task. That's the way we are going about. Thank you, Dr. Sundar. Dr. Anupam, in the in the COVID situation, is the ASN coming out with any guidelines uh, regarding dialysis in chronic kidney disease patients? Any broad guidelines? Which which have an impact on on the U in the U.S. and across the world. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the ASN has a COVID-19 task force uh, that is working very closely with multiple Dallas uh, groups, not only in the U.S. but in the world. We are also working with the International Society of Nephrology and ERA EDTA, uh, other societies around the world. And we've come up with a lot of uh, um, resources that's available on our website. So if you just Google COVID-19 ASN, it'll take you to that website. A lot of webinars, a lot of guidelines. We work very closely with the Center for Disease Control as well, as well as with the federal government. I was fortunate to represent ASN at a meeting at the White House in March 18th, very early in the pandemic, uh, to discuss issues uh, for kidney patients. Uh, you know, in terms of dialysis. So we were the first to recommend telehealth, uh, you know, in terms of coverage for dialysis patients. So we met with President Trump, uh, Vice President Pence, uh, CMS Director Seema Verma and others to highlight the issues, you know, kidney patients were facing. So that resulted in sweeping guidelines within 24 hours uh, changes, at least in the US for how Nephrologists could see patients, you know, in terms of dialysis. So it's been really tremendous. So, you know, clearly COVID-19 has been a disaster and a real a terrible pandemic, but several good things have come out of this pandemic in terms of how we can better serve our patients. Uh, so hopefully those good things will stay on uh, in terms of like telemedicine and, and things like that. So that's really been tremendous. I'd also like to emphasize uh, Sundar's point about transplant. You know, very early, we were all panicked here. You know, our center does about 250, 260 transplants a year. So for about a month, you know, we really slowed down. But now we are back up. In fact, uh, by end of this month, we would have done 300 kidney transplants, our highest ever, uh, you know, in the last 15 years. So, uh, you know, things are back up. We do, we test everybody, uh, you know, for COVID uh, pre-transplant uh, using a rapid test. Uh, that way we know we don't have to use extra you know personal protective equipment uh, in terms of you know gowns and so on so we can be more relaxed uh, in, in doing that and also 
there is shortage of these supplies, uh, even in the US, so it's a challenge. But it has really been tremendous uh, in terms of uh, how, but I would encourage you to visit our website. You don't have to be a member to visit to get access to those resources. If you're not able to find it, send me an email and I will connect you uh, to the right website. Thank you, Dr. Anupam. Uh, Dr. Elhadi, uh, you, would you like to show a few of your slides which you have uh, uh, which you had brought across? You're welcome, or uh, you would like to answer a question? I leave you the choice. You'll have to unmute. I think you need to unmute. Dr. Elhadi, you will have to unmute. We need to hear your voice. Your audio, please. We are able to see your screen, sir, but we are unable to listen. Your audio is not coming. Mm -hmm. Set your microphone. Uh, Dr. Elhadi, uh, I will just go one minute, Dr. Sundar, and come back while you just fix your audio. Yep. Dr. Sundar. Sir. Tell me, Martin. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? I can hear you, Martin. Go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Uh, Dr. Sundar, you are in the city of uh, Bangalore or Bangalore. And. Uh, Bangalore. Yes. Yes. Does the Indian system now have uh, uh, a system where if a kidney uh, is available in uh, a city like Delhi, is it possible to get that one of the kidneys at least to your patient in uh, Bangalore? And if, if so, how is it done? Actually, see, what happens to the kidney, you know, normally uh, it, it goes in-house only or within the city. Because you have one kidney goes into the hospital system in house, the other goes outside. And there's always demand. See, only when there is no recipient available, only then it go out of the city or out of the state. 
So this occurs only for lung or heart like that. Kidneys never go out from Delhi or Bangalore. It's not, it doesn't occur like that because the recipients are enormous number. Like we have now in Karnataka itself, we've got 2,000, 3,000 people waiting. Same way in Delhi also we've got a large list. So there is no reason why it should go out. But if it is possible to go out, I mean, at least they are transporting heart, they're transporting liver, they're transporting other organs uh, through flights. In fact, there are air ambulance and there are uh, uh, helicopters which help. The government itself helps that way for transporting. It's possible. Okay. Sure. Theoretically, it's possible. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sundar. Dr. Elhadi, are you uh, okay with your audio? Uh, your audio audio is not coming through. I, I have few slides. I'll, I'll, it, I'll come I'll come to Dr. Uh, Esavi. I think you have a few slides. You're welcome to just show those few slides. Yeah, and uh, actually my slide is related to my uh, my talks, uh, your talks, and also the comment of Dr. Anibam. Uh, are you are you seeing my screen now? Not yet. Show screen. I already clicked on. That you hear me at least. Yes. Yes. Now uh, the uh, the it is coming. Yeah, so I you know I have uh, I you know I heard the comment of Dr. Uh, Anipam that there are worldwide 850 uh, million uh, patients with CKD nowadays, and also uh, uh, this is almost double the number of diabetic people. And I have some data about this. So there's a three point I will go rapidly, demographic and worldwide statistic, cardiovascular risk of cardiovascular disease and SGL2 inhibitor protective mechanism vasophysiology. Uh, this slide, I prepared it while I'm sitting on a spot here uh, with you. However, I cannot see myself or, or I'm talking. I don't know if this is a normal situation. So as we have, are you following me? Yes, yes. So. Okay, yeah. As we have many students and the primary care physician, and we always keep talking about stage one, two, three, and four kidney disease, but we have to highlight what happened to the patient during these stages. And also, I wanted to bring the attention of the student and primary care that the curum creatinine itself is not a good measurement of kidney function. And the proof is that per, uh, just per, uh, have uh, is if you have a patient with end stage renal disease come you with a creatinine uh, 10, uh, 1000 micromole and his brother come with a creatinine 90 and then you take a kidney from the from the healthy donor to the patient and after one week both of them go out home with a creatinine 90 with a one kidney so the kidney function start to increase after loss of more than 50 percent of kidney function i need all the primary care and the student knows this and this the second point what happened during this stage we keep talking about so it's the problem start to happen at a stage three hypertension anemia uh, min, uh, mineral bone disease and the stage four acidosis hypercatabolism and decreased immune function and also there will be appearance of this lipidemia insulin resistance and increase in atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. This is a few points I, I want to add to the previous speaker about the stage, what happened this is during this stage. Go back to the, the statistic, and I will reach to the point Dr. Anand and say, uh, saying, uh, Rawal saying that uh, worldwide we have 80, 850 million people who have chronic kidney disease. So in the United States, this is some kind of one decade old. All, all, all the people focus about it, dialysis, people which represent only 0.4% of the total population. However, almost more than 11% have some degree of kidney disease. So 3.3 of the total population walking in the street have a stage one, 3% have a stage two, 4.3 have a stage three. These people might have no symptoms and they are walking in the street. So overall, even 11% of all adults in the, uh, in the United States, is a United States statistic over the age of 65, if they don't have nothing, they're healthy like horses, they have a stage 3 to 5 CKD. And this is careful will show you, uh, as this comes from Enhanced study, and show you how the curve increased over time from 1980 to over two decades and a half, and the explanation of increased uh, number of prevalence of uh, CKD is aging, obesity, diabetes, and hypertension. 
And if we come across worldwide, you, worldwide almost 7% of people above the age of 30 had CKD, up to 35% of people above the age of 60, 40. It's worldwide have a CKD, female more than male, and diabetes is the most common cause of this CKD. So if you look to this slide, which is kind of like nine years old, you have almost on this slides, almost in United States only 21 million have a CKD and 26 have million diabetes. Now the, the, the relation have been inversed and the people who have CKD are more than the people who are diabetic. If you look here, more people more than the age of 70, you have 47% of them have CKD, even if they don't have anything. So overall, the prevalence of CKD is more than the privilege of diabetes. But we don't hear the voice. Your know, Dr. Annie Pam is with, with me here, Agrawal, the president of American Society of Nephrology. The people don't hear the voice of nephrology as loud as the diabetologists, while the number of our patients is double, as you said, 850 million worldwide. How many is the number of diabetic worldwide? It's less than 400 million. Uh, for the current, I'm, I'm not speaking about projection, I'm speaking the current. So the, the CKD people, which are silent and more dangerous to the health, and I will show you the cardiovascular risk in a couple of slides, is more double the number of diabetes. And no one, you know, uh, uh, the, the voice of diabetologists are higher than our voice. So we, we hear more about diabetes than we hear more about CKD. And also 50% of people with CKD or dialysis or transplant, the mortality, the cause of death in 50% of people who have a CKD, dialysis or transplant due to cardiovascular disease, 50% and more. And if you look to the traditional risk factors that we used to study in the school, modified and non-modified, and we look to the CKD itself, it becomes the most major risk factor in, for developing cardiovascular disease. See how many factors can lead to cardiovascular disease once the patient develops CKD or end stage renal disease, and you compare them to the traditional known risk factor. And if you look here, the, 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 the prevalence of cardiovascular disease increased from a GFR more than 60 up to GFR, uh, stage five by almost 20 times. The number of people who are developing cardiovascular disease uh, uh, compared to the general population is more than 20 times. This is more than the diabetes. Diabetes increases the risk of cardiovascular disease compared to the general population by four times if it is not complicated with other things. Diabetes increases the cardiovascular risk at itself without other comorbidity four times. CKD increased by 20 times. Interstage renal disease increased by 20 times. And even the American Colleague of Cardiology, American Heart Associated, they consider the CKD stage three and blue is one of the major risk factors as established cardiovascular disease, and they use it as a target for targeting LDL. So people, patients who have a CKD stage three, four, and five, they should have, when we are treating them, treat them as established cardiovascular disease, and we target their LDL blue 100, even blue 70. So this is the recent guideline who considers the CKD as a major player when you uh, uh, plan your treatment, for example, for dyslipidemia, which was not, which was always dependent on cardiovascular risk rather than presence of CKD. And then I will come to the last point, as everyone is highlighting, uh, Dr. Anipan, Dr. El Hadi, about the role of SGL2 inhibitor as a cardioprotective, as a renal protective mechanism. And I will take three minutes or two, three minutes about it. So in normal physiology, SGL2 inhibitor is a receptor is responsible about only of absorption of only around four to five percent of sodium along with glucose in the proximal convoluted tubule. So the amount of sodium delivered to the macula, macula densa is reasonable. And once it is, uh, it is uh, uh, sorry, once it go to the macula densa, it stimulates the uh, adenosine triphosphate. It needs a lot of energy, which is converted to adenosine, adenosine mono and diphosphate, and they end up by adenosine. Adenosine is a vasoconstrictor for the arterial, for the blood vessels. So in a normal amount, it is like a vasoconstrictor mediator. Is a nor in a normal amount, like in a normal physiology, it doesn't affect the afferent artery. If it decreases. It can cause vasodilatation. If it increases, it can cause vasoconstriction. I will come to this later. So, in case of hyperfiltration, 
And in case of diabetes or diabetes nephropathy, so there is increase of expression of SGL2 by 36% and the SGL2-1 by almost 20%. And this lead to increase by threefold the normal amount of uh, sodium absorbed along with glucose around 15%. What is the result of that? The amount of sodium delivered to the distal convoluted tubule, which is a part of the gastroglomerular apparatus, is, de is decreased. So, in a, in a decrease of the delivery of sodium will be read by the tubulo, uh, uh, tubulo glomerular mechanism here as a decrease of plasma volume. And with L, uh, as a decrease of plasma volume, uh, uh, it will end up there is, no, there is no sodium, there is no chloride absorbers, there is no stimulation of ATP, and there is no, there is no synthesis of adenosine, which is vasoconstrictor. This what's called the uh, glomerular tubular mechanism by afferent vasodilatation. Afferent vasodilatation will increase the intragromerular pressure, and this is would hit one of the mechanisms which will hurt the kidney and the diabetes. Using ACA inhibitor or AARBs, we decrease the intragromerular pressure through vasodilatation of the efferent arterial, as Dr. Martin kindly explained uh, uh, in, in, in his talk. So in, in using SGL2 inhibitor, the, the, the opposite happened. When you use SGL2 inhibitor, so you will have increased the amount of sodium delivery to the macula densa by even more than normal. So in this case, there is, will be like, like hyperfiltration overflow in the macula densa. So there will be more absorption of sodium and the chloride, and this will stimulate more adenosine triphosphate Adenosine triphosphate, it needs the energy uh, uh, to absorb sodium and the chloride through the sodium potassium chloride co-transporter. So it will convert adenosine triphosphate to monophosphate and diphosphate, which will further uh, convert to uh, adenosine. Adenosine will act on adenosine type 1 receptor, and acting in an adenosine type receptor, it causes afferent arteriolar vascular smooth muscle vasoconstriction and this will lead to end up by decrease in uh, uh, intragromerular pressure, and this is the protective mechanism. So this is summarized what I just explained, that uh, use of SCL is two inhibitor end up by increasing uh, senses of adenosine, which act as a paracrine fashion via adenosine type 1 receptor in afferent arteriola vascular muscle, muscle cell, causing a vasoconstriction. So if the ACA inhibitor, ARBs, uh, both of and the SGL2 inhibitor, both of them have a protective effect over the kidney. If ACA inhibitor and ARPs have its protective effect through causing efferent arterial vasodilatation, SGL2 inhibitor cause a uh, uh, renal protective effect through afferent arterial vasoconstriction. And this is the protective mechanism of, of SGL2 inhibitor. It's completely the opposite of ACE and the Arabis. Uh, SGL2 inhibitor causes vasoconstriction. I explained the mechanism through uh, afferent arterial vasoconstriction, while ACA inhibitor and ARBs, as explained kindly by Dr. Martin, cause efferent arterial vasodilatation. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Savi. Now we are uh, now uh, we are now under pressure for time. I think I'll leave the last question to Dr. Anupam. There's a question about uh, uh, your advice in probably a couple of sentences on how much salt a CKD patient should take, a general advice. Yeah, salt clearly, um, I'm of the belief that salt is really not good for you, uh, you know, particularly if you have underlying kidney disease, whether you have high blood pressure or not, even just a little bit of salt. So really uh, restricting salt to less than you know, two grams or so, I think is really important. So that really means not adding any extra salt. You know, there's salt in a lot of things we eat and drink and so on. So, but not adding any extra salt on the table, I think it's really important uh, because salt can increase your vascular tone, your vascular resistance, your smooth muscle cell proliferation. So there are a lot of things that happen. The growth factors get stimulated. So it can really cause progression of kidney disease uh, quite rapidly, and more importantly, also make blood pressure control uh, significantly worse. Uh, and obviously, along with salt, you know, you always retain water, so that makes it even more difficult. Uh, so I'm a big proponent of not, uh, you know, of being very, very conservative 
and trying to restrict salt uh, significantly in our diets in terms of one measure of slowing progression of kidney disease and also controlling blood pressure. Thank you, Dr. Anupam. I think uh, uh, we can call it a day. It has been a very fruitful discussion. Personally, I just wanted to thank some of my colleagues in, at CMC Velo, Dr. Vinoy, Dr. Sandosh, Dr. Pradeep, and Dr. Lloyd Winson for helping to give some data for my talk. I personally thank all of you for spending so much of your precious time in, uh, in, in this, uh, in this um, talk. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sundar uh, from India, Dr. Anupam, difference is time zone altogether. Uh, Dr. Esavi, again, uh, I think uh, you are in Boston, I suppose. Yes. yes. Thank, thank you, you very much, Dr. Uh, Dr. Elhadi. Thank you very much for taking time off from your busy practice to spend some valuable time and advice with us. And thank you, Dr. Rakuendra, uh, for uh, giving your talk and uh, helping to introduce and giving your valuable contribution. Uh, thank you very much to the dean of the institution and to the president, and for allowing us to have this intercontinental different time zone interaction. Thank you. I would like to extend my voice to Dr. Martin. I would like to extend my voice to Dr. Maitan to invite Dr. Anibam Agrawal and Dr. Sander to, go, to be one of our uh, honorary guest speaker in one of the CME uh, and uh, International Society of Neurology in Dorset and made by the name of RAC, uh, RAC, uh, Co uh, RAC Health and Medical Science University. Uh, they are most welcome to be uh, uh, one of our guest speakers in the future meeting. I already invited Dr. Agrawal uh, for the 13th of November meeting, but he was very busy to do. But if the, so Dr. Sander have time to be a speaker in the uh, next Friday, Friday 13th November meeting, uh, 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 you are most welcome to give a talk in that meeting. It will be after two months. And uh, you have my contact, or I will take your email and we'll contact you. You are most welcome. Great. Thank you, Thank Thank you, you very, very much. much. Great, great panel. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Hmm? Hello. Hello.